everyone for tuning in. I want to also introduce uh, my good friend who is going to be our mediator tonight, and uh, they can tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, hi, Shimmy. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so much for having me in, Lucy. I really, really appreciate you opening this space and inviting me, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, just want to introduce myself to everyone. My name is Shimmy LaRue. I am a burlesque performer based out of Chicago. I am also a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant as my day job. Um, yes, that is actually a legit day job. Uh, and I am so excited to be able to share with my brothers and sisters in the drag community um, and to kind of go through and talk about what's going on in the community and come to a resolution. I do wanna go over some ground rules initially. Uh, the very first thing is I wanna honor the courage of all of the speakers tonight. This is a very difficult task. We're asking you to be very vulnerable and very open and y'all are stepping up and I really, really appreciate that. I also wanna honor the willingness of all of those who have done harm to come in, to be willing to listen, learn and change. The goal tonight is to hear from members of the community who have been harmed and to review the demands that were created in the open letter and to create specific actions. And we are looking tonight for restorative justice. Yes, that's exactly what we are. And thank you so much, Jimmy, for that introduction. Just to reiterate, yeah, this is uh, not a witch hunt of uh, any sorts. Uh, this is a very needed conversation that, uh, like I said, has been a long time coming and, um, it's at the point now where uh, we can no longer ignore it. And um, I think for our community to do what's right and to be able to actually practice what they preach, um, we're going to have to take some steps forward in making sure that we do have a more inclusive and diverse, uh, quote unquote, boys town, queers town, whatever you would like to call it. Uh, coming up first, I would like to bring Cinna Marie. And Cinna Marie would like to uh, address all three of the people and um, kind of everyone uh, in this conversation this evening. Um, I would like to also remind everyone that um, the Chicago Black Drag Council uh, is just in its beginning stages. As it uh, has started, it's a group of Black performers who work together and uh, are here to include every single Black person because we believe that all Black lives matter. Um, we are doing the work to get started to make it something where everyone will have a part of it. So we want everyone to know that this is not excluding anyone from this conversation. This is also not us saying that we are monolith and this is what every Black person thinks. This is us uh, expressing ourselves and issues that we have personally had. So um, yeah, from there on out, we can go ahead and bring in Senna. Actually, Senna, before, before we hop in, I just, I just want to share one more thing really, really quickly. Um, okay. If there is anyone kind of as we go through the evening, um, we want to make sure not to center feelings. So if anyone feels overwhelmed, like to the point where they feel like they need to cry or need to raise their voice or anything, I'm going to ask that you step back for a moment, recenter yourself, and then come back to the conversation because again we want our focus to be on what is happening at hand the task at hand and then also bringing ourselves back into restoration so just wanted to Fantastic. add that in before thank we you so much Jimmy so great to have you along and yes we're going to bring in Cinna Marie right here in the room hello Cinna can you hear us yes I can hear you Fantastic. Welcome, dear. So good to have you here. Good to be here. Shimmy, this is Senna, and Senna has uh, a message they would like to deliver. Yeah, I just want to speak on um, for myself, but just on behalf of AFAB and burlesque performers in this community that share this space as well, that I am here in full support and just to offer um, my, myself, my body, and my my voice to support what these uh, queens have to say. Um, I have not had any personal uh, experiences with these particular queens being addressed, but I have, I think uh, as much as one voice speaking up about it, I'm there to say, absolutely, I support that person speaking up and I support this, um, this format of moving forward. Um, I think it's a progressive way to go about handling things and I, um, admire the people that are stepping up and I'm here to support you in, by being here and offering my voice. Um, I don't wanna take too much time away, but yeah, that's basically it. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Senna. We appreciate it so much. And we look forward to having your voice be a part of these conversations so much more. Thank, Thank you, my love. Thank you. All right. So next in the conversation, do, 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 do. We are bringing in a representative from Sidetrack and Drew, also known as D. Lynn Cartwright. Do, 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 do. So we'll have them up in just one second. Thank you. Thank you again so much to Abhijit, who is handling everything behind the scenes and making this happen. Do, 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 do. I'm up in just one second. Thank you. All right, so we switched it up a little bit. So we have Kat on screen. Nope, who do we have? There we have Zola. Hi, Zola. <laughs> okay, um, well, wait a second. We're figuring out which screen we're bringing in right here. But thank you again to everyone who uh, tuned in to the uh, Drag Matinee uh, Twitch page this evening, tonight. There we are. Hello, Drew. Am I on? Yes. There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we are. There we are. Do, 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 do. Perfect. Hi. And, uh, I believe we should have a representative from Sidetrack in the room with you. Do you know who that is? Yeah, it's Brian. Brian, Brian Smith, okay. So he should be, yeah. Okay, no problem. Um, I believe Brian, if Brian is just in audio, that works also. We just wanted to have, uh, yes, Brian. Hi, Brian. So everyone is in the room. Fantastic. Awesome. All right. So um, we wanted to bring you into this conversation uh, also, Drew, just to um, have a safe space for other members, uh, specifically Black members from the community, to um, have a conversation with you um, regarding personal things that may have happened um, and also work relationships. Um, we have had many conversations um, about race before, and um, I know where you stand on it, but I believe a vital part in anybody looking to actually bring some restorative justice and some change is uh, actually being able to say I'm sorry in these views in front of people and uh, to be able, you know, just to kind of get all of that out and uh, make it clear what our next steps are and what we're doing to uh, change that. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Okay, awesome. So we are going to bring up first uh, Bambi Banks. And just have Abhijit bring in Bambi. And uh, after we speak to Bambi, uh, Ava Styles will also be joining us. Okay. And yeah, we'll go from there. All right. Hello, Bambi. Audio connected, we good to go. Hello, can you hear us? Oh. Hold on, we can't hear you. Hello. Bambi, hello. Hold on. There we go, I can hear you. Okay. Can All right. Back? Yes, perfect. Cool. Perfect. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Bambi. We also uh, have uh, Shimmy here, who is our mediator tonight. And uh, we have uh, uh, Drew here and also Brian from Sidetrack. Hi, Shimmy. Hi, Drew. Hi, Brian. I just Hi. have a couple of questions for Brian and Drew. Um, Drew, we've worked together many a times. Um, and I feel like I consider you a friend as you do me, correct? Yes. So my question to you is, is like, when you see injustice happening in Sidetrack, when you see the portrayal and the, the facade and you see your face on the side of that bar, why aren't you trying to dismantle the idea of your own character being racist and the whole bar? And why yeah. aren't you helping yeah. like drag queens who face that type of like uh, injustice in the bar? Because I feel like 
if you are someone who is the head queen of that bar, if you are someone who wants to be the face of a bar and you're bringing people into these shows, it is your job as a showrunner to make sure that your performers are protected. And Sidetrack has been one of the pinnacles and like the, the main places where black drag queens do not feel protected at all. So I, we would like to know. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I, it's, before all this happened, I was very like, okay, I'm the, I'm the host of these shows. I don't book these shows. This isn't me. And so I, I've reached out to a lot of the, the black queens that I work with. And I was like, you're right. Like my face is on this. And I, I signed up for Sidetrack to be my home. And every time Dita or Ava or Saya would come to me and say like, there's something going on here. My reaction was unfortunately to be like, I'm so sorry, let's get a shot. Like, let's like, you know, I don't, I don't hire these shows. I don't, I don't do these shows. I'm just the host. Um, and I'm realizing that was a, a weak uh, place for me to stand. Um, so, uh, thank you, Bambi, for, for saying that, because having my face and my name on the side of the bar when things inside of the bar weren't being addressed is on me. And it was easier for me to just do it and go, go with the flow and uh, then to really address what was going on. Um, I'm so sorry to you, to um all the black queens I've worked with at Sidetrack who haven't felt like I did enough for them because they were right, I didn't. Um, I'm really encouraged moving forward. Uh, I, I've already spoken to Sidetrack about this. I didn't book shows before. I didn't really play that role, um, but there's been a lot going on and I'd like to, to have a bigger say in that and to do all that I can to, to make things right. Um, but your, your question is right. It was, yeah, I, I didn't do things right. And I'm sorry. And uh, we're going to fix that. So, uh -huh. so Bambi, yes. I'd, I'd like to know what does, what does wholeness look like to you? So we're, we're listening and we're hearing Brian's apology and we're, we're listening to it, but what, what does action in addition to the language look like to you? Um, well, that was actually my question. I think that uh, this is a question actually for Dixie and uh, Brian, because my next question was, what do you plan to do to reconstruct the bar's programming in order to make it accessible for Black people to feel comfortable enough to even walk into the space and not feel like they will be met with like uh, disdain or any kind of like halt because they aren't of a certain skin type? Um, to be honest, for me, I think that y'all should rework the whole like system from the ground up. The way that y'all, um, the way that y'all, what is the word? Sorry. It's okay. Huh? No, just the way that you uh, produce your shows, like there should be a totally different team that are that is booking talent because it makes no sense that these two. Uh, sorry, white men who uh, don't really do drag. I don't understand why that is the idea of booking talent when this is an art form and people who do this art form are the people who should be uh, running these things. Um, I think that the way that you uh, use your social media is kind of disgusting and it has been for a while. I think that um, the way that y'all tried to switch it up last minute to be in solidarity with us when y'all have never stood for us uh, any other day since I've done drag uh, is shocking. Um, and when I called y'all out about it, there was no response at all to like what y'all were doing. You just continue to do it. So like, what is, what do y'all plan to do to actually make it feel like y'all aren't just pandering to the black audience? Because this bar is also the one who uh, got away with not playing rap music while the bar next door is getting dragged for it. But y'all also don't play rap music, so. What is the uh, what is the plan over there? We would love to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna send it over to Brian. Um, I I I don't hold all of that power, but I'm I'm happy to to use my voice any way that I can to like make that happen. 
Yeah. Um, I just want to throw in there yeah. before Brian brings up, we do understand that um, this is not a problem with um, just these specific people. This goes uh, very far into the scene and very deep into a lot of the pockets in this situation, which is another reason why we did want to have a representative from each bar, even if they do have to go back and ask questions to an owner or someone else about this. Um, it's just very important that we, we try to get to the bigger problem outside of this one person. Um, so yeah, from Brian, I'll let you take it over from there. Hi guys, thank you. Um, yeah, to Lucy's point, I'm here to listen and take this information back. Brad, the general manager of Sidetrack is actually um, facilitating Chicago Pride Fest, virtual Pride Fest right now, that's going on at the same time. So he can't be here, but I'm here to listen and try to answer questions. Um, I know that as Dixie said, there's a lot of stuff that we know we can do better at and we pledge to do better. We've already had um, a discussions again with our queens of color, our black queens. We've had one-on-one -on -one discussions. We've learned a lot again that we didn't know. Um, we want to do better. And that's our, that's our plan is to do better. We know that we're going to change things. We will change things and we want to. So, so, so what, I, what, oh, I want to hearing, what I'm hearing just to make sure that I'm kind of hearing what's going on is that, Brian, you are not the final decision maker. That would be Brad, who's the general manager, correct? The owners would be the final decision makers, but Brad is the general manager, yeah. Okay, great. So can we get a commitment from you to have a conversation with Dixie and Brad and the owners within a specific time frame? I would say the next two weeks, to be able to have a conversation and to be able to come back and present a definitive plan of what that looks like? Yes. We did post um, a statement on Facebook and that was done with everybody's input. I know that no statement is going to change everything because you have to back up a statement. So um, the plan is to follow through on all the many points in the statement and we will do that. Okay, this is, so I, I just, I, I just I just want to be kind of kind of clear about just kind of what I'm I'm hearing in the space right now. This this feels like we're planning to plan, and, and I want to make sure that we are having a conversation towards actionable steps because that is what we're trying to look for coming out of, yeah. of this conversation. And so I want to be able to say, with the power that you currently have, what can you offer as a concrete statement to come back to this group? with actionable plans and not just a plan for where we're, we're going to talk about it. Is there, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but, but Brian, I, I, I don't fully understand like exactly what the, what the bar is hoping to do here, but I just want to say as someone who works there and, and had input into the statement that the bar made, uh, Dita and I both like, we, we talked separately and then we talked uh, to, to sidetrack separately and then together. Um, and the things that Sidetrack has committed to do uh, are hire Black management, hire um, a VJ who is Black, uh, put Black people in places where our patrons and our customers see Black people. Um, a Black person should not feel uncomfortable in our bar and not be able to go talk to a Black person about it. So that is being fixed. And that sucks that it took all of this to get to that, but we're doing that. One thing too, for me, I can say as the host that hosts 95% of the things at Sidetrack, that's not gonna be the case anymore either. We're pulling in more black hosts, also including we want to start a, a weekly show that is um, black queens. Um, we want to, we've heard your, what you said, rightfully so about putting all of our black queens in Beyonce and R&B night. That is ridiculous that that was the shoe that we, we made them wear and we're not gonna do that. Um, so we're going to do more shows like that. And just in general, I'm going to make sure for me, for my role in this, I'm going to make sure that there are more Black hosts and more Black voices. Um, that's what I can say that I'm going to do at Sidetrack. Um, it's okay. Sorry. Uh, I think yeah. it's also just kind of an issue. I understand that Brad has something else to do, but it's kind of messed up that Brad is not the one here to speak for himself because Brad is the one that we actually do do the bookings with. And Brad is the one who has most of the microaggressions. For instance, if I ask to be a part of a Gaga night, it's 
never it's I don't get booked for eight months and then you ask me to do another Beyonce night as if the message that I just wrote you isn't over it and I can't read what is going down so I feel like a um at the town hall I don't care what Brad is doing but make sure he is there because he needs to speak for his own actions um and I think that y'all should also stop doing planning with just a room full of white men there should be black people at the table to plan this stuff and to have y'all hire these people like it, there's no point in y'all planning because y'all haven't done a good job this whole time so <laughs> there needs to be somebody else at the table so yes. that's all i have to say I agree. And brad yeah. that's it <laughs> so, so how, how can we make sure because from what i heard from dixie it is a series of actionable steps adding black management, adding a black VJ, making sure that black patrons have someone who looks like them to be able to come with um, any sort of problems that come up. So those are, those are three very concrete actionable steps. How can we ensure that those are actually followed through? Brian. Um, should I read part of the statement? I know you don't, it's like the, you have to put the words into action, but the statement says what we're gonna do. Sure, and I and I, I absolutely hear that. I what I what I am am looking for, and kind of what I am I'm here just kind of as rapid, kind of putting a bow on it. As yes, there sounds like a plan, but there also needs to be a timeline put in place with that. Oh, for plan. sure, I mean, part of it for us is we've been closed for business for three months. We just were allowed to open outdoor spaces this week, and so. The next step is that Chicago is going to allow bars to have 25% of their occupancy. So there's nothing we can do this week to do this. If we were business as normal, we probably would have made a, a instead of a statement, an announcement of this is what's happening. But right now, business isn't as usual. We've had that discussion with Dixie had said, we talked to Dita, we talked to Saya, we talked to Sasha, we talked to people and said, we are going to do these things, but just know that we have to be open for that to happen. But we've had those discussions. We've talked, you're gonna have Sai on soon, right? Yes. She can talk to you about the discussions we've had about adding a dedicated show for Black Queens. Um, Dixie was that's talking great. about- I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt, Brian. That's uh, that's great that she can speak to that. I guess more than anything, we just wanted someone from Sidetrack to be able oh, to no. speak to Oh no, I'm, I'm saying it, but you're saying, sh show me that it's happening. You know well, what I'm can saying? we just say though, like, I mean, I'm sorry, Brian, but can we just say though that, like, when we are at full capacity, these things will be in place? Is yes. that possible? Yes. Okay, then let's say yes. that. I mean, that was and the point of the statement is the saying, this is what we are committed to do. And if we don't do it, you have every right to hold us accountable for what we've said we're going to do. Okay. All right. We have uh, a scribe here who is also transcribing all of these things so that we can make sure none of this conversation is forgotten about. And we, uh, for all accountability, will be able to check back in on these things. Um, so thank you for that, Brian. Of course. Uh, Thank you also, Dixie, um, for coming through with the uh, concrete actual plans and steps to take there. Like I said, um, this is not only your problem, so this won't be a thing that we're looking just at you at in this situation either. Um, but I really appreciate you knowing and um, actually believing in the steps that we uh, should be taking from here on out. Uh, Bambi, thank you so much for your contribution to this conversation. Uh, I'm going to bring in Eva Styles next who uh, also works at Sidetrack, just to speak for a moment. And thank you again, Bambi. Thanks everyone for being here and listening and contributing. This is uh, an uncomfortable position I know for a lot of people to be in, but um, we're trying to work through that right now to make it comfortable for everybody. So I really appreciate this. And it looks like we have Ava Stiles here. Ava? No, me fix this audio issue. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfect. Thank you, love. Hi, sorry about the headphones. I got to make sure I hear everything clearly. Great. So welcome. I know that you've probably been watching this before. We have uh, Shimmy, who's uh, here being our mediator for us. Um, we also have Drew and we have Brian from uh, Sidetrack. And yeah, we just wanted to be able to open the floor to be able to have a moment for you to you to speak. Um, sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me a part of this. Um, first and foremost, I want to say that um, I co-sign everything Bambi just stated. Um, and I 
am a little disappointed on the response a little bit. Um, I noticed that there's a huge reliance on this is the statement that we put out, that's that. And the question that I think was asked earlier is how are you going to implement those statements? Um, as we all know, um, even if you have a diverse space, there's still racism in diverse spaces. So I think what we're trying to ask is, even though you're gonna hire more black staff, you're gonna hire black management, you're going to hire more black queens, what are you going to do to make sure that even though you have these more black and brown people in these spaces and hopefully AFAB performers as well, because they are severely lacking in those spaces as well, um, what are you going to do to make sure that when they're in that space, that they're not put in a stranglehold? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things to thank you so much for saying that. That's one of the things that um, Dita had brought up, um, that it's not always the staff. It's not always the, the people she's working with. It's the people who are there in the bar. As part of Sidetrack's statement, they did say they want to have a more open no tolerance policy, see something, say something. Um, and I think that's something that we're to continue forward. Um, I think, you know, I think it's going to benefit, you know, these people who are creating these issues, these racist customers who are coming in and uh, being disrespectful to our black customers and our black performers. I think it's going to be beneficial for them as well to see black people in management, to see black people at the higher ends of this. Um, I don't think it's, unfortunately, Ava, I don't think it's gonna happen quickly. I think we are gonna take the steps we need to do. I think I think the community as a whole needs to see where Sidetrack is moving. Um, but I, I know from staff, from my interaction with staff, that focus is very important for them to, to tell the patrons of Sidetrack, you are welcome here, we love you, but we love everyone and specifically black and brown people are welcome and you cannot pull this shit. Um, sorry, Brian. Um, yeah, Ava, I'm sorry. Well, I just, I just wanted just to add in there that even if you put black staff, even if you put social media and stuff like there, um, you have to realize that Although, yes, Sidetrack has a huge problem with their patrons coming in and exercising overt racism, you know, doing very disparaging things to people, saying things, touching, whatever. I think there's some accountability that Sidetrack may not be doing overt stuff, but they're doing covert stuff. Okay. So when you're doing things like saying no certain kind of music, because I've heard these things before, many gay establishments of saying, oh, we don't want this kind of music here because we want to cater to this certain crowd. That's coded language. We don't want for managers to be there for them to get coded messages that they can't exercise the reason why they're there in the first place. I know I've come to uh, management before with issues and I even stated that I am scared to say these things because I am a black person and I'm going to be looked at automatically as the aggressor, uh, not to be believed, many things. So I think we're really trying to ask is even after you do those initial steps, what are you going to do to make sure that with the people there and the changes, like, what are you gonna do to show that it's authentic? One of the things that we've already done is have one-on-one -on -one discussions with our black staff members. And we have, obviously, I mean, we check in with our employees all the time, but we found with these check-ins this week that we're not doing enough to check in on their mental well-being and the microaggressions that they experience when they're at the bar. And that's something that is very upsetting to us because we love these people. Um, and we've committed to check in with them, if not you know, daily, every other day, every time they work and say, did anything happen today? What happened today? And then also empower them that if anything happens while they're on the floor, to immediately contact the manager on duty and the manager on duty will go deal with that person. We have set a zero tolerance 
for anybody to make any kind of racially charged statement and it will be dealt with immediately. We don't want any of our staff to feel that that's happening and to know that sometimes it does is very, very upsetting. So Brian, I would also recommend that you have an incident plan put into place and have that incident plan created with the help of your black staff and management. Having an incident plan in place will be, if X happens, then we will do Y. And it needs to be explicit and think about doing it as if you are explaining it to a five-year-old. That's excellent. And, I just and, and that plan needs to be in place and that plan needs to be circulated widely, and that plan needs to be seen and vetted by your Black performers and by other members of the Black community. You can bring it to the Black Drag Council, but it will be imperative for you to start to build the trust that I'm hearing is lost completely at folks at Sidetrack. You'll need to have an incident plan in place for what happens. Got it. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Ava. Thank, thank you for you. being a part of this conversation. Uh, thank you for sharing your voice here in this. I know how hard it can be um, working at a bar and uh, having to confront things like this head on and I really appreciate your voice. So thank you so much. And we're going to go ahead and bring in um, Miss Saya Naomi, who has also been a long time Part of Sidetrack. There we are, Saya. Let her get this off of mute. <laughs> it's still muted, love. Let You're muted, see. baby. I can't hear you. You're on mute. <laughs> Saya, it's the shine. Um, it's the please, shine. Here. You're muted, babe. <laughs> unmute. Um, whoever the host, the who the host is, you might be able to unmute. There we oh, go. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, Saya. How are you? Um, whoever the host, the who the host is, you might be able to unmute. There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you now, Saya. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. How are y'all feeling? We're doing all right. We're in here having important conversations. Uh, looks like we might have a little I can't bit hear. of a delay. I'm great. I'm great. How are y'all feeling? We're doing all right. We're in here having important conversations. I see uh, that. Like I can't hear. I'm great. I'm great. So we uh, have Shimmy here, who is our mediator. Um, and also you already, uh, uh, Drew and uh, Brian here, representing uh, Sidetrack. We just wanted to go ahead and open up the floor for uh, you to be able to uh, get anything out that you need to get out, uh, uh, express anything you need to express to us. We're, we're getting we're getting a lot of feedback, so it's it's difficult yeah. to hear. Yeah. We're, we're, getting, we're getting a lot of feedback, so it's it's difficult to hear. Here, let me see if I turn. You Okay, so I just turned off my phone. Can y'all hear me better? Yes, I think so. Do you have headphones there? Yeah, still, still getting feedback. All right, you, you may you may need to turn down the volume on your Oh, turn that volume on the TV. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Y'all, I'm new to technology, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, you, know you know what? It's a uh, yeah. experience I'm going to be the greatest space of here to try to bring it in, but I'm like, ah, how do I do this? It's Can you stop good, this music? Bro. It's all good. So, uh, There's music the going on. I'm like, <laughs> okay, Welcome I'm ready. Conversation. Uh, we have Shimmy here, who is our mediator. Uh, we also have uh, Drew and uh, Brian here from Sidetrack, and just wanted to open the floor to you to uh, have a moment to speak. Sorry. I'm still over here trying to work on things technically. Oh my God. You're good to go. We hear, we hear you. You're good yeah, to go. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what are we going on? Can somebody push me into where we need to start from or where I need to go? 
Well, here's where you can, you can start wherever you'd like. This is a chance for you to be able to speak on whatever you'd like to regarding Sidetrack, being a Black performer there, et cetera. Okay, so what I would say is I've been listening to a lot of the girls talking about their situations of like what Sidetrack has been and the people that they're going after and things like that of such. I just want to say like my overall performances and my time at Sidetrack has been different, I guess, from the other girls. I've been there for years and I've witnessed a display of like bad things happening to me for racism without, that wasn't in the control of the staff. I've had people attack me outside staffing. So yes, that type of thing happens everywhere. As for all the love that I've gotten and support and support that I got in a sidetrack, I haven't been one of those queens that was booked at this bar, that bar, this bar, that bar, this bar, that bar. That I haven't been. I've been doing this, this for 17 years. So I've been a part of it and I've seen so much change. I ended up having to be, become a resident at sidetrack because I wasn't booked nowhere else. So I had no, I have no bad things to say about sidetrack as a black queen. I know whenever I've gotten a attacked or beat down by customers at Sidetrack, those customers were removed immediately. So although there may not be a lot of space that you can see all this comfort happening, there is some, a lot of people that have our back in Sidetrack. I have been called out my name in Sidetrack and literally had to get picked up by Brian. The, for, the people that could be on the forefront that may not be here right now, they can't Brian and Dixie can't take the blame for all of that. If we're in a position where we want to really make things change, we got to start with ourselves. Let's start changing things ourselves individually and bring things in as a whole. We can't keep on fighting because all the fighting that we're going to keep doing is only going to lead into more ruckus. I understand that people was pissed off and mad that Sidetrack put boards up first and Progress put boards up first. I understand all that. But in the same sentence of me saying that, I can't bash this place that gave me a home. I didn't feel all the neglect, all the, the, the black and white there. I didn't feel it. Maybe because I was the token queen, or one of the token queens there. Now, I didn't feel like the Possibly. token queen there because I also work Beyonce night that everybody's talking about so much. The Beyonce night, our Beyonce night is cast like any other show is cast. It has its cast, me, Sasha, Dita. Now, I don't want my place taken from nobody because all these bars on the ship have cast. I am not a part of none of those casts, nor am I a part of their rotating. So I want my position to stay. I will be a Beyonce girl because I have a job that's going to pay me, give me coins. And that's going to be the people that come there, come there to see me because they don't see me nowhere else. I have nothing negative to say about Sidetrack in defense of it all because I didn't fear Saya, can I losing my job. Second? Can I stop you for one second, Saya? Just for one second, uh, really quick. I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, uh, before you probably got on the conversation, I don't know if you're watching or not, but I did make a statement to say that, uh, first of all, black people are not a monolith. So not everybody feels the same way about everything. So I'm glad that you've had that experience. Um, that is not most people's experience. And like you said, that may be because you were the token or you were the favorite girl of that situation. I can also speak on my own experience that um, I get treated a lot differently than a lot of other people do too because of the status that I've built and the work that I've done and everything I've done in the community. So I always do try to keep that in focus. So yeah, like I said, everybody has different points of view and everything on that. Um, I'm just wondering if you can at least recognize that there are other people who have not had that same experience um, as you there at Sidetrack. I understand fully that there are many girls, multiple girls that haven't had that same experience that I had that sidetrack because I've had these same terrible experiences at Berlin with Tranica, at Roscoe's with Roscoe's staff, at, si at Hydrate with Hydrate like people. I've had this problem all around. Me, I'm just simply saying at Sidetrack's at the forefront where models. we're talking about things at. I'm a representative of Sidetrack, so I'm speaking up about it. I'm, a, I'm apologizing on all Sidetrack's behalf to my other Black brothers and sisters that come there well, and don't feel welcome. Because be I know how that feels when I go through the doors and, I'm, and I don't have my face on. 
I get treated differently, not by staff, but by patrons that come in there. There is one staff member that does, however, treat me different. I don't know his name because if I did, I will call him out. It's not a big deal to me. I get through things, you know, but this person knows who I am and still holds me at the door for stupid shit. You know, I could be coming in to get my drunk, my check like this. And he acts like he don't know who I am. What am I supposed to do? Blame the whole bar for somebody's stupid actions. Now, no, this person. Like, uh, wait, no, wait, I, I want I, 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 I to make sure that, that this kind of doesn't become a bit of a tit, a tit and tat. Um, again, Saya, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, it is important that we hear a wide range of experiences of what's going on. Um, I do want to just be really clear about the fact that, yes, it is super important to hear everyone's experiences, but we also want to share that there are a lot of queens who are not feeling the same way. And so we just want to kind of voice all of those things. I also want to be mindful of the time. Uh, we are at quarter of nine right now. And yeah. I know that we want to have some conversation with some other queens who are also coming in. True. Uh, but yeah, I, again, yes. I want to reiterate what Lucy said. All black queens are not a monolith. It is important to hear everyone's feedback. It is also important that as we grow as a community that we do right and do better by everyone. And so I think that the things that Dixie and Brian and Lucy were talking about earlier, that all of those things are in place and that we do those things, but we do also want to recognize that everyone's experiences are different. Absolutely. 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 All right. So um, thank you again, all of you, uh, for being here for this conversation. Thank you, Saya, for coming in and bringing your perspective. Thank, uh, you, thank you, Drew, uh, for being here to uh, speak on behalf of yourself and not only yourself, uh, for having the plan for Sidetrack Bar. Uh, thank you, Brian, for being here. I hope you can take this conversation back to uh, whoever you need to speak to about it. Um, also, let them know that we will be checking back in um, with the roundtable that we are having. Uh, I can't, regarding can I say one more thing before we end? Sorry, just super quick. We've talked a lot about Beyonce night. We have a lot of other programming and nights where we book uh, all different color queens. Saya is a resident queen Thursday night at Pop Rock. She's there every Thursday. It has nothing to do with Beyonce night. We have people come for Musical Monday. We have people perform at Gaga. So that's what, those are the places where we want to get more people. And then Saya, we've also had a conversation with you about a new show, correct? Yes, that you'll be involved in that will involve. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not I, making I think excuses. I, 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 I think sure that we realize that there are. We're not talking about one night. We're talking about improving all the nights. Sure. Well, it's great to hear you say that, Brian. I hope that we're able to uh, back that up, and we'll see that very soon. So, thank you for being a part of this conversation, thank uh, you. everybody. Thank you we'll all. be checking back in with y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Uh, so coming up next, uh, we are going to bring in Kat Sass. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Thank you again, Shimmy, for being here to be the mediator in these Where's times and help propel these conversations along and also um, make sure that we are covering all the bases here. Uh, hi, Kat. Shimmy Hello, for being here you. to be the mediator. Yes. I think we have some feedback on your end, maybe. So uh, we are covering all the bases here. Uh, yeah, you'll have to turn down your computer. Yeah. I think we have some feedback on your end, maybe. My, so, on my end? Yeah, on Kat's end, can you turn down the computer? You'll have to turn down your computer. Is this better? I think we got it. My, on my end? Uh, on Kat's end, can you turn down the computer? I think we got it. We got it. We're good. we're good now. Okay, we're good to go. Um, so yes, we uh, wanted to address a few people in this conversation who are uh, different show producers and are part of different bars and uh, collective. Um, Kat Sass, uh, we just wanted to have a conversation uh, with you specifically uh, regarding one instance, but we also wanted to make the floor open for anyone who felt that they may have something they need to express that they haven't been able to before. Uh, we have our mediator, Shimmy, here, who's uh, going to be helping everything along uh, and just making sure that we're having a uh, good conversation that's actually moving the relationships along and trying to better things. Uh, and yeah, we'll take it from there. So um, we actually already 
just making sure that we're having a uh, good conversation that's actually moving the relationships along and trying to better things. Um, and yeah, we'll take it from there. So um, we actually already. I can hear myself. Cat, is there a problem? There's an echo with your words. Is there something on the Zoom that I've done wrong? Should I turn? I can hear myself. I'm sorry, I hear an echo really bad. Oh, damn it. So if you can, if you can mute or do you have headphones? I can, I can get some. Sorry, I hear an echo. Let's go, let's go with headphones real quick and see if that helps. Okay. One second, I apologize. If you can mute or do you have headphones? I'll get some headphones. I can get some. Sorry, I can get some. And Zola, Zola, you may also want to put on headphones just, just to be preemptive. Just in case. Okay, so yeah, thank you everyone else who has uh, tuned into this stream tonight on the uh, Drag Matinee Twitch. For anyone who just popped in here, uh, this is the uh, Chicago Black Drag uh, Council's Town Hall. Uh, we are just trying to actually have some conversations with uh, some different community members um, and actually bring, the, bring about some restorative justice uh, to our community and community members. So uh, yeah, here we are to actually have some conversations with uh, some different communities. Uh, you may also want to mute the Twitch stream. That will also help. Yeah. All right, are we all good? All right, Kat, can we, Kat, can you say something so we can make sure we hear you? Testing, testing. Perfect, yes. we can hear you. Perfect, this is absolutely okay. perfect. Okay, um, so yeah, we just wanted to go ahead and open the floor for uh, people to be able, be able to have a conversation in a um, in a comfortable environment. We also wanted the to give you a, the opportunity to uh, speak for yourself here in this uh, online environment for transparency and accountability. So uh, this is a part of the reason why we helped bring this about tonight. Um, I actually would like to start this conversation off uh, with speaking to Zola. Um, and I believe that we already have Zola set up in the room. So Ms. Zola, uh, if you would like to uh, speak to Kat first, I'll, I'll let you begin the conversation. Um, sure, do I sound okay? Yeah, everything's perfect. Okay, stunning. Um, yeah, Kat and I have had um, previously recently a lot of elongated conversations upon like the effects of like the events that occur between us and like, how that affected like my livelihood and my potential as just like uh, individual freelancing and nightlife, et cetera, so on and so forth. And what that restorative justice, what that like accountability and just um, um, newfound awareness looks like within like learning from those experiences and working to push not only um, past them, but push to like growing and developing and just like actively working against like racism and like transphobia and all of like the isms that work within this white patriarchy of repression that is America. Um, so we've had a lot of conversations within that scope. Um, we've had to try, we've tried to have conversations in the past that haven't um, ended up ideally, I will say, but the last couple of rounds of conversations we have have ended up with like a lot of growth and I think a lot of um, I'll say satisfaction for me personally within like where the conversations have gone and like the um, the things that Kat has committed themselves to doing to um, yeah just hold themselves accountable. So Kat if you'd like a moment to speak uh, after that you you can. Well, I want to thank the Black Drag Council for having me tonight. I'm thankful to be a part of the discussion and a part of the community. Uh, I'm here more to listen than to speak. Um, and I recognize that this situation is not about me, um, but I recognize that I have fault in how I have dealt with a situation in which I was injured and had a difficulty finding a way to maintain a livelihood. As we know, there's not a lot of insurance or easy ways to get um, to stay, to, to protect yourself when you get hurt. And I let my anger guide the way that I felt about the entirety of the situation. And 
the way that I view it, the way that I have viewed it before I spoke with Zola and I didn't have the, uh, I didn't have like the way to speak about it. I felt like I didn't understand how to speak about it and I didn't follow up to learn how to speak about it. And I feel I was at fault there for sure. And in addition to that, and I just wanna say personally, it is my, I didn't get into drag for the fame or the money <laughs> or any of that shenanigans. I made a lot more money in film and TV before this. Um, I got into it because it felt like a good opportunity to um, perform and be of service and to help community members and particularly young people. And I recognize that I have failed Zola in that sense in such a serious way and exposed her to harm. And I appreciate that we've, able, we've been able to have this conversation and that I've been able to um, follow up and think uh, about how to not only repair, but to be an active ally and to be of service to my community, which is something that is close to my heart, if you know me. And uh, I look forward to just hearing more and listening um, I was not aware that, I just want to say I was not aware that T-Rex told people not to book her or told her or told them who she was. And I question my people that I have worked with closely. And I question- um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt really quickly. Um, I, I, I can't speak exactly to what I do know and I, 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 I don't know. Um, I, I can say that I have seen you be there when T-Rex was saying something about this other person because I did have to come up and be like, that's not the truth. Um, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to go back and forth uh, with it. I just don't, I just want to make sure that we're not putting anything out there that either one of us is going to regret saying, uh, just keeping everything absolutely honest. Um, because I have personally seen you two talking about Zola together to other people. Um, so yeah, yeah I just, and, just and a part of this accountability and this conversation, I think that um, we do need to have a conversation about uh, how sometimes a lot of, or at least it seems that it happens a lot, um, a lot of uh, white people and white entertainers specifically stick together. And um, I, I, I have seen this personally happen in this situation. So. Oh, so I, I thank you for sharing that. And again, part of part of the listening process is also accepting responsibility and making concrete changes moving forward. So what I want to ask now is Zola, as the person who has been harmed by this interaction, what does restoration look like for you? Um, it looks like many things. I mean, like when individuals, especially white entertainers have like access to large platforms and audiences and things of that nature like the best thing that I can hope that they would do is like deliver like those platforms to like black people to like black queer people and black trans people who like need the opportunities to reach larger audiences the most and who are the most volatile and like unsteady in terms of being able to attain that large following um so and we've talked about it before like if um, if they ever like come across a gig of like a, a large caliber, et cetera, so on and so forth, like linking like either molasses or like another black trans collective, et cetera. And just like sharing within the opportunity, like the resources and like the gain and like um, essentially um, just a chance to expand as a collective itself because we see time after time, like institutional racism within performing and entertainment itself is largely based off traditions of like scooting black people to the side and that only um, exponentially grows when you add the intersections of queerness and transness and like um, femme identifying folks, so on and so forth. Um, so that is what I want to see. That is what I want to see done. I want to see opportunities and growth and development given to like black and brown queer and trans people um, via CAT and via T-Rex and via all the other white people who were silent about me being fucking canceled in the scene. Um, that's what I need to see. That's mm -hmm. what I need to see. It's been far too long that black folk within this scene 
uh, the drag scene, the club scene, techno scene, even, even just like the scene of like DJs around Chicago have been excommunicated for either opening their mouths and uh, combating racism in the space or doing something highly minor, unaggressive, and that would be overlooked if it was a white entertainer. All right, there needs to be, yeah. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. That's, that was, those are very specific things. And so Kat, what I wanna ask of you now, as a producer in the Chicago drag community, what are the things that you can commit to right now to speak to bringing in that level of diversity, to bringing in black and, and black trans and particular performers and making sure that they have equitable and equal standing in your performances and using your platform to help promote those performers? Well, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue producing, but in the event that I do, I will bring in a black co-producer who will have every bit of power um, and say as, as I do. Um, but I can say that I am committed to not only Zola, um, I, should I speak about like those specific commitments since I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not super planning on doing a lot um, in the future, but in the event that I do, I will not um, be silent if I see any racism or I see um, anyone being um, spoken badly about or canceled, quote unquote, I won't allow bars to, that I work at to treat any other performers unfairly, but speaking specifically to the Zola instance, um, I am uh, donating every month to Molasses Chicago, encouraging folks to also donate to Molasses Chicago. I am um, trying, I'm, I've spoken with Zola about um, using my platform to secure some sponsorships, um, to help secure some sponsorships for Molasses. Um, and additionally, um, I am, uh, speaking with a few people about participating in Pass the Mic, which will um, use my platform to give Black voices more credence and more um, visibility and accountability or, you know, accountability on my part. Um, and that's what I'm basically focusing on right now. I guess I'm not thinking about anything except for how I can be a good ally at this time and in the future going forward as a person and not really thinking about continuing on producing. Okay. So that's so so what I'm hearing right now is you're just you're just stepping back completely. And so in stepping back completely, that also opens up the space for the platforms that you currently have. And I'm I'm going to take my moderator hat off just for a brief second. Um, just to say that as when I talk with corporate clients, I tell them the biggest thing that you can do to actually help those who need that help is to cut a check. It's, it's to just cut a check. And so my question then becomes, now that you are stepping away from this platform for however long that is, um, and you're, that, that space will then be open up, what does, what does that financial restitution look like? Because I, you know, in, in, listening to the stories and kind of listening to what is going on, it it sounds like it was very damaging to Zola. Like it, it cost her booking. It cost her the ability to grow her platform. It cost her the ability to progress as a performer. So the question becomes, what do you do to make that right? And yes, I am definitely not going to say that, that the stuff that you're not doing already isn't going to be helpful because yes, it is. But the question also becomes, what are you going to do to make Zola whole for what she has already lost? Um, well, I have a payment and plan. I have a payment plan in place with her every month, um, and I don't have any income or prospects at this time. But I will commit to that minimum, and anything I make over that, I, I can guarantee a percentage, and will continue to to do that and to stay completely involved with anything I can do to be of aid to her and to the community. Um, just because I'm stepping back from goddess doesn't mean that I abdicate any responsibility in this matter. Um, I take full responsibility for, um, for not being, not being, not being helpful and being damaging to her. Um, and not having the hard conversations and trying to listen to her perspective. When I got hurt, I was not thinking about how she was feeling. I was thinking about my own anger. And 
in addition to the money, that's something that I can do for other white people. I can say that I can speak about it and continue to speak about it to them and be, and be very clear about my own failings and how can that serve as a guide to other white people to not fail our black trans youth in this way so egregiously. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I guess, I hope that that clarifies a little bit. I, I commit to a portion of, I commit a portion of my income to her and I don't know what that looks like, but I know what a minimum looks like. And I committed that to her and I will go on above that for a year to two years is what I was um, talking you know, with her about. I, I just want to break in really quick to say, um, I also want to let you know, like this isn't a shakedown. This isn't uh, us trying to completely defund you or take anything away from you, even though um, there were some people in this situation who almost had that happen to them. We don't, you know, want revenge. We just want justice in this situation. So, um, and also just speaking to you pulling away from the scene, I hope it's not something that's just because of this. Um, and this is friend to friend right now. I do know you as a person. I do know um, your value as a person. I do not think you are a bad person in any way, shape or form, um, which is why I also think it's important that instead of kind of pulling away, I just wanna make sure that you are really here in this conversation and a part of it, just because I don't want it to seem like you're like, okay, I'm running away from the scene now, this happened, I don't wanna talk about it anymore. Thank you for that comment. And thank you for speaking to my person and character. I appreciate it. And I understand that it's not anything you have to do, of course. Um, I'm not going to leave the scene. I just, for my mental health, I'm trying to be cautious in that way, but also be as active, be an active participant, commit okay. to the things that I wrote in my letter. And those things I commit to, Pe anyone that knows me knows whatever I commit to, I stick with it. And I will not um, shirk any responsibility in that matter. It's not what a grown ass person does. Okay. All right, well, that's good to hear. Um, we have one more person that I'm gonna bring in just to speak to you very quickly, just um, about some of their experiences. Um, that's it. Uh, we have uh, Joe Lewis that's going to pop in really quick. And then um, after that, we uh, will go on to Ben. Um, so yes, if I can just have Joe step in. should be popping up right now. All right, Joe, if you can take your, come off mute for us, please. Hi there. Um, Joe, you can, you can come off mute now. Joe, can you hear us? There we go. Um, so yes, uh, we just wanted to bring Joe into the conversation to have a minute to uh, be able to speak in this uh, safe environment. Uh, Joe, we have Shimmy here who is our mediator, uh, making sure that uh, we are having a constructive conversation and moving things along. Um, and we have Kat present. Uh, just, uh, yeah, go ahead and take the floor. You have a minute or so. Um, hey, Kat, hey, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to touch real quick, throw back real quick. Uh, there'll be a round table on Tuesday at 5 p.m. It'll be a Zoom meeting, meeting that's gonna have all the G GMs from the North Side Queer Bars. Uh, and we've asked them to bring a black employee with them uh, for good reason, so that they can speak on issues, so they can also be heard. Uh, so that relates back to the thing going on with Sidetrack to make sure that people are following up and that we do have a plan of action that is um, able to be implemented. Um, one other thing throwing back to sidetrack is that oftentimes there's a lot of times uh, queens will confide to me and have to look around the corner to see if there is uh, management around before they can speak. That says very clearly that it's not an open environment for black queens to speak on issues, especially if they're turning to me to speak on it. That's always been very odd to me, um, just to say on that. Uh, and also the importance as a bar to 
that sidetrack hopefully is leading the way to be setting a standard of behavior that your patrons must follow, which I do believe they did talk about in their um, statement. Uh, but also it's about, I wanna talk on how um, things can be made to use against us as people of color and as employees, how oftentimes our employment is used against us and to silence us. And that's kind of where you come in, Kat. Um, for me, um, it goes back to in the beginning when you first started your show with biohazards and I reached out and called you. And I always feel that's very important that if a black person calls you and is like, you might wanna watch this, there's a reason. And especially me who's been in the scene as long as I've been, just a quick heads up saying the biohazard thing was offensive to the POS community. It also was offensive to the trans community because you're kind of throwing your biology in their face. And then it took quite a while for that to be changed, um, which was odd but it did eventually we could change and there was progress, but it didn't mean that I didn't have to sit there and work that night and be like, God, wow, okay. But um, that just speaks to your privilege and at the time your lack of understanding in it and how that really affected not only you, but a lot of other people. Um, when it comes to a lot of things and notes and behaviors that you've taken, I feel that a lot of them come from Tranica and are rooted in Tranica even the way that Zola was approached and your anger and where it came from, came from Tranica and her willingness to implement this TARP policy, how she was so quick on the night to destroy someone and decimate them. And you saw that and used it as a weapon, as a channel for your anger. And I see that and I know that's where that came from and you've acknowledged it and we're moving forward from that. Um, we've spoken many times, uh, either downstairs or upstairs, about our goings on because I always have respected you and we only hold people accountable who we actually care about and who we actually respect. If I didn't care about someone, I would get rid of them. I've done that before. It's not hard to do that when the truth is on your side. But one thing that, as I spoke on about our place of employment, using our jobs and our livelihood to silence us, um, there've been times where we've, I, like one time we were at Scarlet and we did that birthday thing and I was so excited and so happy to be finally a part of the group and doing a gig together. And I was in face and I was excited and everyone decided that they were gonna use Joe Lewis instead of my stage name. I have plenty of stage names. Mm -hmm. Couldn't understand why we chose to focus on that one, especially from everyone who's so adamant about uh, pronouns and fighting for that and making sure that people are properly represented and that their identity is represented. Um, but then that night got crazy and I kind of broke down while I was even on stage and I got home and broke down even further and then watched as many people started messaging me as I was screaming into the night sky, which oftentimes when your voice is silenced, those midnight ramblings become your own riot because you're not even allowed to speak. Because you know that if you speak that your entire livelihood is on the line. And then I watched as people message me and said, you better talk to Kat right now. You better talk to Kat right now, as if there was some plan of action that you would put into place to hurt me, to cancel me in the same way that Zola ended up being canceled. And you've said, I've, I never did anything to hurt you. And I was like, yeah, you didn't, but it seems as if you were cocked and ready to do so, which was extremely hurtful and only fed into more paranoia and more fear of my own livelihood. And then working together, we deal, well, dealt with this whole tipping gate problem where a lot of producers and other people didn't know how to tip and other bartenders that I worked with didn't want to serve you at all. But I always would welcome it and I was like, I can deal with it, let's do it. But every time it was as if I was, I was put in this difficult position because for someone who screams, know your worth, know your worth, demand your worth, you weren't willing to pay me my worth. And we talked about that and we've expanded on it, but it came this big thing back and forth, back and forth where it was not consistent. And I was every time frustrated and so confused, which is how I became so confused and disappointed in how you decided to produce Goddess. Because Goddess is a great, amazing show. It's very welcoming. It's about art. It's about people. And who wouldn't want to support that? So I was so excited to do your show and finally get a chance to like be a part of everything that it would be. But then I find out at the end, there is no money. There is not even a drink ticket, even though we personally allotted drink tickets for you to give out to the performers. And then I realized that your system of producing 
was like farming talent. So you would have new people come in and they would bring in 10 people, each paid $10, which you never got the okay to even charge $10. Because there's a producer also at Berlin who has had a side effect of your negative actions, where when they find out that you're not paying people, they come to me and go, I thought you had to Berlin, you perform at Berlin for free. And I said, no, we pay, we pay. And I also instituted an entire system of fellow producers so that I can never gain too much power and I'm kept in check. And so I'm not taking too much money home. I only take home what I, what I do for a small little 20 bucks for producing and my little like $40 for a fee and 20 extra dollars if I'm hosting. That's how I set it up. But then you fought really hard for a door. Joe, I'm sorry, can I interrupt really quickly? Uh, just one second. I just wanted to uh, touch on something that we just brought up really quickly. Uh, you were saying that performers are not being paid. Was that in reference to Goddess? Yes. Is that true, Kat? Goddess is and always has been an open stage show with some headliners. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, with some headliners um, and the function of it. Um, and actually we have a full bookkeeping records that we're totally able to turn over to the public and be completely transparent about. Um, we have a, a, and I'm more than happy to do that. And also to address some of Joe's issues uh, with me, but I also feel like it's a yeah, long time. Issues. I'm, I'm sorry. One second, Joe. I just, I just wanted them to finish the conversation about the, about the payment for performers. So you, you said that the headliners and yourself were getting paid. Um, the headliners. So the headliners, um, ourselves, um, it wasn't, I actually, uh, at, until COVID, I had only produced Goddess by myself twice. Mm -hmm. um, I have always been a co-producer of the show and um, we have but, but even when you were co-producing it um, my what, what I'm hearing is that um, only selective people were paid in the cast we were I mean it was billed as an open stage show and that's how we kept it we were as we were growing which we were growing a lot in the last year we were looking at trying to figure out how to make it make sense that we wouldn't lose money um doing because we lost a lot of money the first couple of years of the show um which i understand that's like part of the producing situ situation okay. um but as i'm oh, sorry oh no just saying so, so i just i just want to make sure and again i want to be incredibly mindful of time so yes. just to kind of put a bullet on it headliners are paid producers are paid everyone else was open stage correct yes and it was yes. meant to be sorry okay and, that, and that's and that's that's why i just again i just want to just kind of put put a point on that. Um, again, I just want to kind of be mindful of making sure Sorry. that we're all having a chance to, to be here. Yes. And I think we have other folks that we need to speak with also. We do, we have one more group. So I'm gonna bring Joe back in. So uh, Joe, you can just uh, just have another few moments to, to finish talking uh, to Kat. I'll be quick. The biggest thing is just the way that that's set up, it's not done in, in a creative environment to induce talent and actually foster talent. It goes against what you said in your standpoint. And to know that you're walking home with hundreds of dollars while people walked away with nothing was very hard for me. And the impact as a fellow producer and what it did to talent and when they came to me and having to explain that to them, the Berlin name, your actions, and the fact that when I spoke on this in the public, I'd have special meetings with Berlin management and the owners conduct where my job was put in jeopardy and I was told I would be fired if I spoke out again. Where I had to take the time off work to go and be told that, by, and they said that they agreed with me 100%. But Joe, you're telling the 100% the truth, but we can't, we can't let you speak publicly about it. You have to just shut up and take it. And I've been told to shut up and take it my whole life. And even though I was not wrong, you silenced my voice repeatedly. And then you knew it. Some of you knew it. And then somehow you got to just do whatever you wanted. That's the number one thing that was said to me is that they can do whatever they want. They can get away with murder and it's fine. And for me, who knows you and knows you say, cool, you're cool. You're aware, you're woke, you're one of the most, I wanted to be your friend, I wanted to care for you and all of these things, but to constantly be disappointed was so hurtful to me because I really cared. And then I just couldn't understand why this was set up this way and why whenever anyone spoke about it, that they were silenced. And that this, this complicity that you had with Tranica throughout, complicit, you were fully aware and fully complicit. And you could have spoken up, you could have done something and you chose to benefit 
and financially benefit from these actions. I just, I just wanted you to know that whether you knew it or not, I had to sit there and suffer in silence. The nights that I went home and cried because I was being held to be silent so that you could get away and walk away with all this money, even though you are talented, you are worth it. But then in the public, you said to everyone, demand your worth, demand your worth, demand your worth. But you weren't gonna pay these people their worth. Instead, you were gonna actively, complicitly benefit from their suffering. That's all I wanted to say about it. It's like, it's like being a slave master. Thank you for being here and speaking with us tonight, Joe. We really appreciate you uh, sharing this perspective in uh, this experience in this situation. And uh, I hope that, um, I, I hope that Kat, this is a learning experience uh, for you in many different ways. And it can lead to some everlasting change in every, um aspect of your life um I, as i said i can speak to your character of you being a good person i know that you are most definitely trying to do the work uh no human being is perfect and we never should uh pretend to be in any way um but that being said we all still have some more work that uh we, we could be doing right now um so it is good to see that you are committed to doing the work and that you are being receptive and open to these conversations and uh thank you for being a part of this uh, town hall this evening Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm happy to produce our, our spreadsheets with all of our earnings publicly because we have not made bankroll off of this show ever. Um, there's no instance in which I have benefited a lot from it other than the satisfaction of doing the show and, and producing it. Um, I apologize for hurting other people and I apologize for hurting Joe Mama, but it, it, it occurs to me that there is a longer conversation there with Joe Mama that needs to happen um, that I would appreciate a mediator for. Um, if one could be uh, given to us, I would be happy to help um, yeah, pay, you for, it or pay for it. Because, Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I, Joe, Joe has tried to get me fired from jobs because of my gender multiple times and I have emails regarding that as well. Oh, it please show me where. Wait, okay. Wait, 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 we, we are not going to do this. If, no. if there, if there is a request for an offline conversation with the mediator, let's- Right, but then to try and throw a bomb, it's a complete bomb because I've got my book too, Kat. I've got full books and you can, you can sure show me where I try to get you fired on your gender. Please show me where. I'd love to know. And I'd love to see those books because I watched you count the money. I was down there and I got to hear you. I could hear you when you talked about infiltration and the moves you tried to make against not I just do. me, but everyone else. I want to count so the money. Well, so at this point, so so it's then please send those over and please let's have a meteor. But I will not stand for you throwing lies out there and try to make me out to be some genderless person. You always try to empower your gender. Okay, Joe, Joe, Joe. Joe, we're not going. To, we're not going to do that. We're not right, going so to do this, that. This is definitely a conversation that I would very strongly suggest happen offline, and that a mediator is brought in, because they, these are very, very serious allegations. They and, are. And putting something like that out in a larger form like this has ramifications outside of just this conversation and that is completely unfair that. to everyone so let please let's let us have this conversation offline this is take this is taking away from what we the aim of this conversation is supposed to be let's take that out none of these statements are none of these statements are helpful Kat, no. it's not it's not cool to drop something like that especially at the end of a conversation they knew no, what they were doing so so let's so let's, right. so let's, so let's, let's on this take, note let's take that offline we're gonna have Kat and Joe um, leave the room right now. No, I'm gonna get my lawyer too, because- No, we're gonna have you leave the room, Joe. And we're gonna have Kat leave the room. Thank you both for being in here. Thank Goodbye. You. Um, just, just as a reminder, folks, this, just as a reminder, our goal is to talk about the community. Our goal is to look at how we can restore ourselves within the community, these kinds of, these are very, very, very serious allegations. And it really is not, it's not okay to put them in this kind of conversation. Those, those really are bombs and that's not okay. 
So that's I definitely wonder- not okay. And I feel like a conversation we didn't get to have is um, just about certain people. Uh, I don't know, victimizing themselves and also uh, using femhood or like womanhood as a cloak to kind of protect them from conversations that like need to be had. But I'm not even going to get into the rest of that right here because like you said, that's another conversation that needs to happen from it. We are going to bring in our next people um, to uh, go ahead and end this night off. Uh, So we're going to bring in uh, Ben, also known as T-Rex, and uh, representatives from Roscoe's and Berlin. So uh, Taylor and Sean. And just to, just to reiterate, um, and I'll say this again when everyone gets back in here, this is not, this is not what that turned into. This is not throwing bombs and uh, starting um, arguments. We are not going to derail from the conversation that we've had and that we want to continue having. So, um, and I yeah. and I, I just I just want to follow up that yes, the conversation that we are having, and I'm also keeping an eye on the chat that's mm-hmm. happening. Also, the conversation that we are having, yes, they are very emotional. They are very deep. They are very personal. And yes, we are definitely here to talk about our experiences. We are not here to have ad hominem and personal attacks. That is not what this space is here for. And so if that happens, then we will shut that down. This is not what this space is here to do. Okay? Thank you, Shimmy. Thank you, Shimmy, for reiterating that. So uh, it looks like um, we have uh, Ben in the room. Uh, We also have Taylor, who is a representative uh, for Berlin Nightclub. Um, I also see Sean. And uh, Sean, who do you have with you? This is Brendan, the general manager. And we have Brendan, the general manager from Roscoe's representing this conversation. Um, So we had a few people that wanted to uh, speak to T-Rex really quick just to share experiences. Uh, But before we get to that part, I wanted to actually start it off by reading uh, the original open letter that we sent to Ben just so that everyone was on the same page where we were coming from. Um, We've had a bit of time to expand on everything that we talked about um, originally and have checked in with um, at least a management of Berlin, but we have uh, Roscoe's here just to make sure that um, everyone is on on board with what's happening and that we have support in uh, what we're looking for today. So um, let's go ahead and start with the letter. The letter begins, hi T-Rex, recently the Chicago drag community has expressed a great deal of pain that has been put upon us from you. You have abused your power and you've you've helped perpetuate racism through Boys Town by reducing all people of color to tokens for your personal gain. You've based the value of our art off of winning your competition. You've used influence to push multiple people out of the scene who've made mistakes. You've used your influence to force people out of spaces that we once thought were safe. You've made people uncomfortable with your constant criticisms. You've used your talents, you've used our talents, excuse me, to grow your platform and wallet, but you've never shown true appreciation for what we've done for you. Instead, we are met with the impossible task of impressing you. You have taken a position of power in an art form you rarely practice, and it is time you make space for others. We're coming to you today to demand changes that will lead us in the right direction to make amends. If our demands are not met, we as the Black drag community and allies refuse to support you or any of your platforms. Now, um, we'll get back into the specific demands in just a moment. Um, I will come back to speak to you on that one, but uh, first I wanted to bring in our first speaker, and that will be Shay Coulee. So if uh, Abhijit, you can bring in Shay. We're just going to uh, have an open floor for Shay to be able to share experiences um, that she has had and uh, anything else she would like to share. Hello, Shay. Hello. Shay, can you hear us? Let's see. Miss Shay Kule, can you hear us? Are you there? <laughs> can you hear us? <laughs> Can't hear us? All right. Let's try and figure out the audio real quick.
And like I said earlier in the conversation that uh, oh, these, oh, there we go. Can you hear us? Hello? Can you say it one more time? Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect, perfect. Thank I'll you so much. I'll be all high tech with some um, Bluetooth speakers, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Shay, thank you so much for being here at this uh, town hall that we're having this evening. I thought it was uh, very important to have you a part of this conversation. You've been a part of Chicago Drag for a very long time and uh, have uh, experienced uh, just about anything that we can kind of think of in these uh, situations. Uh, first of all, I wanted to introduce you to our mediator, Shimmy, who is here to handle the conversations. Um, we also have Taylor here as a representative from Berlin, and we have uh, Brendan and Sean from uh, Roscoe's. But uh, yeah, go ahead and take the floor and uh, just have a moment to speak. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for allowing me to be here and be in this space and speak about um, my experiences. Um, I think that this is a really good, you know, start having these conversations, but, you know, there's a lot of action that we need to do. Um, so I'm just going to just directly address you, Ben. Um, and I'm going to start off by saying that um, we started in this scene around the very same time together. Um, and I was a member of Trend Kids Most Wanted. I was a member of the cast at Berlin Drag Matinee and its inception when we took that over from Mistress Vanna and Anastasia. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with you at Milwaukee Prides and Dicks and all over. We had a very long standing working relationship um, in my time as a drag queen in Chicago before I made it on the race. Um, and for that very reason, that allowed you to exercise a certain amount of privilege over me um, in the scene. And uh, at times when you felt as if I was being too bold, you used that and weaponized that against me to try and blacklist me and stop me from working. So you directly attacked my livelihood, which is an act of violence and I need you to understand that today. I want to also speak to a very specific experience that I had with you, where we were, had already worked a show and were backstage with the staff. Um, this was at Scarlet at the time that we were doing Train Kids Most Wanted. And uh, I was the only person of color back there. Um, it was you and Bryce and some, Buddy else. And you had made a joke because at that time we would do cast numbers at the top of the show that for Black History Month, it would be funny as a number, as a cast, if we performed to Britney Spears' Slave for You with me dressed as a slave while the rest of you whipped me. Do you remember that? I, I do. Okay. I want you to know that that experience has stayed with me for a very long time because you were somebody that I considered a friend. And the fact that my hurt and my displeasure at being subjected to that and how I had to almost beg you for an apology really let me know where I stood to you, not just as a person, but as a person of color specifically. So fast forward to when Berlin Drag Matinee is in its, you know, heyday and I was regularly a rotation in the cast and I was oftentimes booked at Naughty Little Cabaret prior to the show because drag was my livelihood. And I would come to the show and oftentimes I would be doing three numbers while the rest of the girls were doing two, making the same amount of money as everybody else. So in the lineup, I was always one of the first girls, probably second, and was honestly stretched thin through every performance, but it was my drag. I loved it. It gave me a thrill. I loved the audience. I loved the experience. However, there was one show in particular, which was the musical theater show, in which uh, I was changing very rapidly um, for my, for my second number, 
I didn't even have a space in the dressing room. I was getting ready in the back by the coats. And the stage manager, Abby, came down, asked me, Shay, how much longer do you need to get ready? I said, Abby, I need 30 seconds. And I heard her say to you up from the stairs, she needs 30 seconds. And I heard your voice. You heard her say that. And you announced my name to the audience. You directly tried to sabotage me in a show for stunts. You got into my head. And then upstairs on the mic to further make a joke of me, say, oh, you had one job. OK, I obviously was angry. I did my performance as usual. You mocked my anger after the performance by saying, we'll speak in my office because you're the only person that gets to hold the mic. And then after we had a discourse downstairs where I told you exactly how angry I was with you, how I felt that I was being mistreated by you and how I felt like you weren't doing the same that you were requesting of the girls in the show to do and it was not fair for you to treat me that way. That pricked your ego. And then you made sure that you blacklisted me in the community until I got on Drag Race. And then because I get on a larger platform, then all of a sudden it's like everything needs to be fine. But I need you to understand that even after that, you came for my daughters. And so even though we had conversations after I came back from filming Drag Race, I thought that the things with you and me were done, but then my daughters are still experiencing these microaggressions and that comes right back to me. So for me, what I need from you is, I, I, I read your apology, but I want to see real concrete actions when it comes to producing your shows, when you're casting, making decisions at Drag Matinee, if you're going to, to yield every you know, other week to a Black drag queen to host. Um, I think that that is a fabulous idea when it comes to producing. I think that you should get, you know, one of the girls, Bambi Kule would be a perfect one to come and help you out with making those decisions because I know that she is somebody that you have directly targeted and I think that that would be great restitution for her. Um, I just want to say in, in closing in this statement that the reason why I wanted to come here and speak to you is because I've been gifted the opportunity to be on a platform that has lended a sense of validity to what I say. And I think that it is very important that people hear those stories because I've worked with you closely and that is how you treat me. So I just want to encourage you to do better because there's a lot of people that have been negatively affected by you. And a lot of those people are still hurting from the things that you've done. So thank you. Thank you so much, Shay. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation and uh, sharing your perspective um, and sharing those uh, experiences with us. We really appreciate your voice. Thank you for lending it tonight. Thank you so much. So we are going to uh, bring in our next person to speak at this moment. And we are going to bring in Bambi Banks Kule on that note. So we can have Bambi come on in the room. And like I said earlier, uh, we're going to uh, have the uh, open floor um, and then we're going to just go back over the uh, list of demands and talk to the owners, uh, the the uh, representatives we have here with us today. Hi, Bambi. Your audio on? You working? Turn on your audio. You're muted. You're on mute. <laughs> there you go. Bambi. Hello. Can we hear you? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. All right, uh, just opening the floor, you are already a part of this conversation, so you know Shimmy, uh, you know everyone else that is uh, involved here, but just to reiterate, we have uh, Taylor who is here on behalf of Berlin, and uh, we also have Sean and Brendan on uh, behalf of Roscoe. So uh, yeah, the floor is open. Hello, um, I just have like a couple of questions for, well, my question for all three of you. Um, T, I know you read, um, 
the agreement and it hasn't been written yet. Lucy's going to do that later. But my question to you personally is how do you plan to uh, mend your relationship and ties with the drag community, the black community past our um, demands? Um, I feel like there is a lot of personal apologies that should be had. I think there is a lot of personal um, reflection that should be had. And I think that there should be a plan in place within a week to uh, show that you actually care for the black community because I feel, not just I feel, I know for a fact that uh, you don't have many black friends if you have any black friends. Um, and that is a tale or a sign for many black people to know that somebody is not um, receptive to the black um, experience or understand a lot of black experiences. So um, I just wanna know how you plan on furthering yourself on learning more about your community. Um, thank you, first of all. Um, I, I spoke a little uh, in what I wrote about my intention of bringing other people in uh, to basically uh, work closely with me with developing things. So instead of me wielding all the power as far as I cast the show, I host the show, um, I would essentially be saying to uh, other people, I'm not sure how many, um, but the idea would be to bring people in uh, that could cast, could host, could co-host. Um, but the idea is essentially to uh, to take my power and and let other people have it. I would still be there, but I would be making sure that those voices were heard. We're yeah. actually going to touch on this, uh, not to interrupt you, sorry. Uh, we're actually going to touch on this in the list of demands also, just uh, to further kind of explain that idea um, as it relates back to the demands that we already presented to you as far, in, uh, as, far as uh, creating shows underneath an umbrella or something of that sort. Okay. Um, well, I also want to ask all three of you, Taylor and... Uh, Brendan and Sean also. Um, how do y'all plan, the same question I have for Sidetrack, how do y'all plan to change your programming to where uh, it feels more accessible to Black people? Because I know, Sean, you have uh, implemented Black Girl Magic and that is amazing. I think that, that is great work. Uh, it was one of the first, uh, not one of the first, but like since I've done drag, uh, one of the first prevalent Black shows that showed all Black performers. However, Roscoe's has also been uh, under heat to uh, harbor very negative feelings towards the black community to not make them feel safe and not make them feel like they're welcoming your bar. Taylor also with Berlin, uh, it did feel safe when I first moved there, but after a change of producers and things like that is not feel is not felt very safe at Berlin as well to uh, express certain like blackness or even like have any black creators. Y'all have, I think one black producer on staff now. And that is just crazy to me because these black drag queens across Chicago are all very talented producers. So for there to be uh, uh, imbalance uh, just goes to show how the businesses value our talents as well. So I would like to know what plans are in place for both of you to uh, just make pe black people feel safe and wanted in your establishments. Um, I can talk about that uh, from my perspective. Um, I think we have brought in a lot of different black producers and artists in the couple years that I've been around, but I know that the history of all this goes way beyond that. Um, and one hurdle that I see for people at Berlin specifically is that when we do bring people in, they're brought in on a weeknight um, and for those who have done those nights, you know that it's a fucking struggle to make any money and to get visibility when that's what you're offered. And the unfortunate thing that has happened there is that the weekends just get sort of 
stuck where they're at and they're not changed. And once people get those spots, they're so reluctant to share that space. And that's a problem. Um, I would definitely want to bring in a black person to lead our programming. Um, I don't feel that my voice is needed on that front whatsoever. Um, I actually Taylor, if I can just push back really quickly. So what I'm sure. what I'm hearing is that it sounds like that is something that can be done as an actionable step. If you have black shows or black producers that are happening during the week, it is fairly easy to just switch up the shows. It's yeah. it's it's pretty easy just to switch up the shows. And that and that is something that you actually can do. Um, and that is an actionable step that can happen. Um, and yes, and I fully understand that, you know, different shows bring in different clientele, but it's a great way of exposing people to different shows by just switching up the shows. Yep, I agree with that completely. Um, I also I think that, like, oh, yeah, no. sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I think that Berlin staff, also I have worked those week nights and I think that Berlin staff uh, often meets those nights with, uh, you know, remorse and regret that they have to work them, um, that is not okay. There needs to be sensitivity training somewhere across the board with your, uh, with the bar staff and with security because there is no reason that somebody should be met when they're trying to like, you know, produce something or uh, harbor something that um, they don't have the support of the people that sh are working next to them. We are bringing money to your bar regardless. If there was no programming, there would be no money. I don't care how much money is even there. Like, do y'all understand that it really takes a lot to like promote and produce these shows and have your name put out there only for no one to really support you on the team and you're having to do this on your own. Yeah. Like that's how it feels. I have to bring y'all money in order to feel validated. And then even when you are brought money, it's still not met with the support because y'all are still waiting for the next thing to bring you money. So do you believe and support the shows or are you just looking for money at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And money is definitely a force behind the decisions that are made and it, it takes too much power um, from the conversation. and. I'll just say like one place that I've personally failed is I know that I've worked with a lot of people that are watching this right now. And I know that um, I've had conversations in private with a lot of people about the feelings that are being expressed today. And I, when I turn to go talk to the owners about this stuff, I get very political and I get very diplomatic because I do want it to change. I absolutely think the whole thing needs to be destroyed and rebuilt from the ground up. Um, but I think that I've been too careful and too soft in how I communicate that to the people that ultimately do make those decisions. And I'm gonna be more forward about that stuff moving forward. Um, that's all, yeah, that's what I would say to that. And I just want to uh, reiterate also why I have a moment. Um, I said this earlier to the to to everyone that was in the conversation, but um, we also know that this does not all lie on you. Um, you are acting as a representative and you are a part of this conversation, but there are people above you that also need to be answering these questions and need to be involved in this conversation and we need to be holding them accountable also. Um, we do plan on having, uh, like Joe said earlier, another town hall on Tuesday with a lot of the uh, North side like queer bars to have this discussion so that um, will be taken way further, way further into detail um, too. But yeah, just to, just to reiterate, we, we know this is not a just y'all problem. Um, y'all are just acting as a representative, so y'all are just going to hear it today. <laughs> That's that. Um, I, I, would, I, would else? Also, I, I would also challenge, especially as representatives, this is a fantastic opportunity to not only just hear what's happening, but also to see the passion and the emotion behind it and know that this is something that is really, really serious. And I thank you for being honest and saying that you were more political than you needed to be and more diplomatic than you needed to be. But let's take this as a really great opportunity to say, no, this is, it's time for us to not be politically correct when it comes to these kinds of issues. So let's, let's, let's definitely take this as an opportunity to, to do that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Anything else you wanted to add? 
Um, I would like the same question to be answered by Sean. I think that also, uh, like I said, Roscoe's much like uh, Sidetrack is met with a lot of racial tension. And I'd like to know what you plan to do with your programming, such as um, your Tuesdays with your drag show, your XYZs, all of these shows that aren't Black Girl Magic, because though Black Girl Magic is great, it is one night out of 30. So what is the plan put in place well, I think, uh, Brendan here, I'm going to chime in. Um, I think that that is a very important message. You know, we don't get off the hook because we have Black Girl Magic. And I don't want people to think that. It's not our crutch. It's not something like, oh, we have that, we're good to go. We, we, it off the list or something. we are just as accountable whether we host Black Girl Magic or not. You know, there, it, it goes beyond that. It is one show. It is one night a month. Um, and I think that our, our overall purpose today um, coming into this and not necessarily having an, a, a, an agenda of what we were gonna talk about was an opportunity for us to really listen. And I would welcome in you know the next week, the next two weeks, an opportunity, you know, obviously responsibly socially distancing, um, but to sit down and really talk about Roscoe's one-on-one -on -one and our relationship with you, Lucy, with you, Bambi, um, with whoever else we've worked with or haven't worked with that wanna be part of the conversation, because I won't lie. Roscoe's has made mistakes in the past. Roscoe's could be better. And we are trying to be better. And it takes more than black girl magic, absolutely. But, you know, Sean and my um, commitment to all of the people that we work with, um, I think that speaks, um, our love for you, it, it speaks to the community and we want to work with you. And if we have to take responsibility for anything and apologize for anything, um, I think it would be that we were not proactive enough to include you um, when we should have been um, in decisions that we were making. And we rely on um, other people's input too much without checking in on them and what um, their motives might be or their prejudices or whatnot. Um, and that falls on me, you know, um, and falls on Sean as well. But we are 100% committing um, to an open dialogue and conversations and brainstorming and finding opportunities where we can showcase things um, that should have been showcased in the past and weren't and from this point moving forward will be in whatever format that comes in you know I can't we can't come up with a, a great idea today that's going to take more than this kind of conversation um, but you have our commitment for that conversation to happen amazing okay that's very uh, good to hear and like i said we have a scribe who also is uh just making sure that we have a record of all these things just uh for accountability and transparency sake so um we know exactly what's going on in that situation so um that's good to hear um bambi is there anything else you wanted to say yeah i just have one last question for t um so you've often uh stated your rules you have certain rules for drag matinee you have certain rules for the way that you book people everyone knows these rules um my question to you is why don't the rules apply to you? I feel like drag is an art form first and a business second, and you've labeled yourself as a businessman and a drag queen second. Um, I feel that if you, if you want to set a certain amount of rules, you have to apply by those rules as well. So why is it that girls are met with uh, disdain and, uh, funny little comments every time that she has a gig from Saturday to Sunday in two different venues and is wearing the same outfit when you have one gig uh, every week and you don't even change your outfits like periodically and you also get paid a lot more than other performers so there really is no excuse while other people are you know poverty stricken and have to like you know scrape their coins to impress you I just want to know why you're not met with the same rules. You're not holding yourself to the same standard. You don't, you ask for impossible things from performers, but you don't perform. So why is that? And do you plan to hold yourself to your own impossible standards? Um, I, thank you. Um, you know, I realized that what I thought were, uh, small shitty quips as far as hey you're gonna wear that again Th things like that I don't need to be saying that um, uh, 
Well, it's not that you don't need to be saying it, it's that you don't hold yourself to this gatekeeper position and then decide to like be friends. You have, it's one or the other. So you can either be somebody's mentor, the gatekeeper of Chicago and all of those things, or you can be somebody's friend. But the thing is, is that the way that you're friends, that those two cannot blend because you can't be shitty to someone and then also be their livelihood. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um, I, I, I really don't have an answer. I truthfully, I don't have an answer. Um, it's something that I've spent the last few days thinking about. I, I have held people to too high of standards, especially for the amount that they do have to work. Um, and so I, I, I will take that on hundred percent. Um, the comments will not happen. Um, and the, the, you know, I, I guess it's just, I mean, outside of the comments, I mean, I, I've agreed to, uh, you know, the idea that it, it doesn't have to, you know, I, before I would say, let's get some new hair, let's get new outfits and stuff and let's have, you know, um, high energy music, stuff like that. I'm gonna remove the extra rules that have put other people, um, have given other people requirements that I don't have because I'm in charge and, you know, it was just kind of like, well, I do what I want. Um, I will take responsibility for that. And uh, those rules are changing and, um, yeah, it, I, I mean, do you have something to say? Yeah, yeah I, I just, I just kind of want to dig into a, a the statement you made that that I heard that just kind of, kind of tweaked me the wrong way a little bit. So you you made the statement that you know sometimes you've had too high of standards. However, that's not necessarily what I'm hearing from the group. What I'm hearing is that there are different sets of standards, and so I just want to make sure that we're being clear about what we're talking about here. That it's not necessarily too high of standards is that the standards are not equal for everyone. I but would have to I just say, want to make sure that we're, we're talking about that. That is yeah, very I would have true. To say that's exactly right, Shimmy. Okay. I think that it just, when, I, when I heard it, I just, it just sounded, it sounded like something we needed to kind of explain a little bit more. I just think that specifically with even the way that you do operate in your own system, it is still harder for black girls to like make a name for themselves within mm -hmm. this community while you hold all the power. You don't fairly share our content. You don't fairly treat us uh, with the same respect that you treat your other uh, ethnic winners or white passing winners or white winners, whoever they are. Um, it should not take Ari Gato, someone who is extremely talented, like twice the amount of time that it took Denali to, to come up like, yes, Denali is equally as talented, but they, that's the key word, equal. And I get that someone is your friend, but you do not get to be the, the key holder and not, and show favoritism. Very you true. are playing with people's livelihoods. And <laughs> also, I still need you to hold yourself to the impossible standard that you hold everyone else. I need you to have new hair every time we see you, new dresses. I need new nails. I need new shoes. Like, I need it all because- And bam, bam, that's gonna, we're going to go over more into that for the list of demands just to not derail the conversation too much. But yes, uh, Bambi is touching on something that, that that we did touch on there. Sorry to interrupt, Bambi. Is there anything else you wanted to you wanted to put out there? No, I just need, I just need you to hold yourself to that exact standard so that you feel the same struggle that the rest of us do. The all the people that signed that letter, the the seventy plus people, the drag queens that work under you feel uh, the pressure that they have. Uh, coming at them just to be just to work in their own scene like yes Chicago is a great place to start drag because we do have the system that we have however it is really hard to make it here and there have been many people who have moved to this city because of UT Rex and have had their careers derailed and they don't work as much and usually are not great for our environment because of you and you leave them high and dry so there's a lot of stuff that you need to answer for and there's a lot of personal apologies and i think that almost every drag queen in chicago has you have something to apologize for so i would start reaching out that's just me okay uh, i think that's uh 
some great information that we left out here and also something uh, definitely to to think about in this. Thank you so much, Bambi, for uh, sharing that and being here with us multiple times today. I appreciate you so much. So we're going to uh, bring in one more person to speak face to face, and then I am going to go over the uh, list of demands that I have come up with with the uh, Chicago Black Drag Council. Um, next up is going to be Zola. Zola is going to come back in. Hello. Hello, Zola. Hi. Hi. Hello, love. You are already a part of this conversation. Uh oh. I know. There we yeah. are. Um, I was, and just um, listening to the things that should. Did you say something? I'm no, you're good, but love, continue. Oh, okay, cool, cool. I'm um, just listening to the things that Shay and Bambi have remarked on, just upon like the commentary to you that was made by you in the past, like proposing ideas of like mimicking slavery and whipping Shay as a black performer and also intentionally trying to sabotage her and me putting the timeline together of how soon these events have occurred. Like Shay made it on Drag Race when I was 18 or 19 years old. That's three or four years ago. You perpetuated insane amounts of racial violence to a black performer three or four years ago. This is not a decade, this is not seven years or anywhere within the proximity of that. This was very recent in time, extremely recent in time. Um, also, I feel like there is no, and because of this, there is no clear delineation of what you have to do to make up for this, I think the demands that you're being met with are very gracious and very lenient because if it was up to me, if I got to write these demands, I would absolutely positively insist on your removal from the scene completely. Years ago of making someone even have to think or ponder about being perpetuated as a slave on a stage in front of people in a scene that is filled with white faggots. Are you serious? Are you serious? There's no forgiveness. If not that, what I would want to see, which is easily, easily held accountable for, is for you to take the salary that you earned at every single one of your shows, multiply that by the number of years that you have been doing these shows gatekeeping, and compare it to the salaries of those girls who win Crash Landing, who you pay for drag matinee, the Black one. And however much time it takes for you however much time it takes for you to add up all those years and equal it to the salary you were paying yourself, that is how long you stay out of this scene. So they may be getting $2,200 a fucking uh, six months for doing drag that equals what, 4,400? And you may be making $100,000 a year, wait that long. When $4,400, however many years it takes equals 100,000 and then come back. There is no forgiveness, you are done. Have I made myself clear? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Zola. Thank you. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, love? Um, yeah, briefly. Okay. <laughs> um, Taylor, just like someone who has organized molasses at Berlin, the reason that we left because Black trans people are consistently made unsafe there by the amount of individuals, the amount of white men that enter that space intentionally looking for trans people to berate or harass. Security have continuously not done enough to protect specifically Black trans women. Specifically over and over, I see girls either thrown out of a club or further harassed by staff or given like shade from staff because they have to handle like individuals who are coming after them, not foster safety. We cannot foster safety for black trans people in that space and it has continued to be that way for years. I also hear the standards that you held, the standards that molasses was held to as a collective of black trans entertainers creating a for us by us moment were ridiculous. Having us being paid 
a minuscule budget budget in like the scope of like how much you pay other shows, but then also required to bring in $1,500 for the bar to maintain like a very, very minuscule bonus was ridiculous given the socioeconomic and racial politics of our team itself. It made no logical sense whatsoever. And that's all I have to say to you. For the individuals who are managing Roscoe's as representatives, I've never come into your establishment before because again, four, five years ago, as like a young girl, a young tea girl living in Chicago, I was told not to go into these places because people were called racial epithets and people were called slurs that looked like me. So I just want you all to know that although I've never entered your establishment or paid any money or like uh, fan service to it, that these opinions, these these experiences of Black people are last. They influence all of your clientele. So that what I'm saying that you need to do is make a revolutionary and monumental change that just supersedes saying that, oh, we know Black girl magic is not enough. Well, what is enough? Do you know what is enough? Do you know what is enough? You can't, you can't offer us anything else with saying Black girl magic isn't enough. We need plans and action. Because when you say Black girl magic isn't enough, you just end up adding one more show with Black drag queens in it, we are left with the questions, well, what did they say was enough? Is it okay if I respond? I, we have, okay, I haven't had the opportunity to meet you in person, so this is our, fir our first interaction. Um, but I, I realized that everyone wants solid answers. And I think the most solid thing I can say is I don't think that we're sitting here thinking that um, another black drag show is the answer to any of this. I think the answer is that we are trying to create a space where the people, people four years from now, people, young people now don't have the same um, impression of Roscoe's that you did when you were younger. And we want to change that. And we want our staff to be accommodating. We want our um, security trained properly. We want all the things to be done so that Roscoe's is a safe and welcoming space to everybody. And that goes beyond, that goes beyond drag shows. You know, there's more to this than just a drag show. Um, I, I hope that makes sense. Um, and that's why um, a, I, I personally don't have a, a solid plan to present at this exact moment because the seriousness, seriousness of this result uh, to me requires a lot of thought, a lot of training, um, a lot of communication and a lot of education for me because as the general manager, it's my responsibility at the top to pass that down. And I need to know more so that I can be my best self to train everyone that works here. So that's, that's what I mean when I say that we don't have um, a plan today because it's not just at the top of you know, writing down some notes and saying, okay, we're gonna do this. Because it's a hot button issue right now and it could have been a long time ago, uh, but I don't wanna react. I can want I, to have something- Can I interject really yeah. quickly? Yeah, I'm losing- Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, Zola. Yeah. Uh, Zola, you're breaking up, darling. Am I really? Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear me? Oh. Yes. Did it work? Did it work? Did yes. It, did it work? Okay, cool. Um, as you as you've been going through like the reasonings behind why we don't have concrete answers, one that I have for you is like offering more spaces to individuals who like are in like a thriving black and queer community within Chicago that is filled with trans people to the brim. And that is like individuals who participate in ballroom. And I'm not talking about the popularized forms of ballroom that we see within Pose, that we see within Vice, that we see within Legendary, but offering these spaces and these access points and these waypoints to black and black trans and queer individuals who need the spaces the most, who need spaces to find community and that are safe, that can be like secure for them as like community spaces to gather. Because as we know in the past, again, maybe 10 years ago, maybe seven, I would say, individuals who were within ballroom who would even be caught voting at the club would be escorted out, would be asked to leave, would be banned. So I say this again to say, seven years ago is not that long ago. Restorative justice takes decades. If you're not doing decades of work 
to account for the people you have hurt directly, in this instance, ballroom uh, affiliates and like members, then what are you doing? So, That's it. so, so one thing, one thing that I would recommend, uh, Brendan, as a first step, is to come and work with the Black Drag Council. So the Black Drag Council is made up of a number of queens. Work with them on what what inclusivity looks like, what programming could look like. Make sure Zola is a part of that conversation and open up, open up that conversation of what that could legitimately look like. That is a conversation that does not have to happen on a forum like Twitch. But again, fully understand that, you know, not having a 15 point plan is going to happen today. But what could happen today is a commitment of saying, once we get off of this call, we will set up a time with the, the Black Drag Council to sit and to listen and to work with what our programming could look like so that it is open and inclusive and not just adding another show. And that also will help in your learning and growth process too. Absolutely, and I don't think I know, I might not, not have said it in those exact words, but that's what I was trying to get across when I spoke previously is you do have our commitment to that. Absolutely, 100%. On paper, on video, it is there and you have our commitment. Okay. That is a, a great start to hear. Like I said, we are having a uh, town hall, a open roundtable discussion on Tuesday um, with a lot of the bar owners and general managers of uh, Northside queer uh, businesses um, to talk directly about um, what they plan on doing uh, in the future uh, to help with some restorative justice and to help make sure that uh, the Black children and POC children in the future feel more welcome. Uh, so we will definitely go into that more. Uh, thank you so much Zola for popping back in and speaking with us again. Thank you so much Zola. I appreciate your voice so much my love. So, of course. Um, I forgot about uh, one person we were going to have Tati come in who is going to be reading on behalf of Luca Me. Uh, they're going to read a short passage and then we are going to go into the list of demands and uh, wrap this up. So I am going to ask Abhijit to bring in Tati really quick. and we can continue that conversation. We wanted to make sure that uh, we had some voices from just uh, about everyone uh, that we could. So yes, Tatiana uh, will be reading on behalf of Luca Me. Tati, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfect, absolutely perfect. Okay. So I know you've already been tuning in and uh, actually helping a lot with working, putting all this together. Uh, we have Shimmy LaRue here as our mediator. Uh, mm -hmm. We have uh, T-Rex also known as Ben here. We have Taylor as a representative from Berlin and we have Brendan and Sean from Roscoe's. So uh, yeah, yeah, if you would like to speak and also read uh, on behalf of Luke, that's great. Yeah, um, I don't know T-Rex personally. Um, I just met Taylor the other day. I've been to Roscoe's and Berlin and I've experienced racism there. And especially just as a uh, queer woman presenting, I'm non-binary, but I am queer. Uh, going into these places, I don't feel welcome at all. The amount of cis gay men uh, that have come and told me to leave because this is not my space is truly disgusting. And you all need to work better to make this not just open for cis gay men, but also open for non-binary people, for trans people, for AFAB people, 100%. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm gonna say about me. And I'm gonna read this from Luca Me, who is a black drag king in Chicago. Um, they couldn't make it tonight, but I am reading on their behalf. Dear Tranica Rex, I want to address your impact and offense to the up and coming Chicago drag scene. February 12th, 2018, I had made it to the second round of crash landing and was competing in the Stephen King themed round. I had made an error by not notifying the production team that I would be using stage blood for my number. And immediately after I had performed, you proceeded to berate me on the mic while I was still on stage for using stage blood. A little of which got on the audience for not using the other stage. At this point, while it was a lapse in judgment on my end to use the stage blood in this way, and for that I am sorry, there was also no instruction on what we could or couldn't do on the Berlin stage as, which, as well as which stage to use and when. I had very little knowledge of how the competition worked at the time since I had only been to Berlin a few times and had literally never met or spoken to you prior or to getting on stage. It was humiliating to receive that feedback on stage. The audience was 
uh, filled with the show directors and producers across the city. So not only did it make me look rad in front of potential future employers, but the severity of your words was not needed. It was unprofessional and disheart disheartening. And I spent a solid probably 15 minutes crying in the bathroom afterwards and texting a friend to be ready to come pick me up right after the show. Nico came to me afterwards and excused your behavior on drunkenness and stated that I could still compete in crash landing in the future, but the damage was already done. I had already become fearful of being blacklisted in a scene for a mistake I'd made, something that could have been fixed by letting me know offstage not to do that again. Also, the blood used was professional stage blood that washes out of anything by soaking briefly in cold water. I do not believe in excusing someone for being drunk because as a show host, it is your job to be professional. If you can't act in a professional manner while drunk, you should assess how much you drink while working. I was completely turned off from crash landing and would only come out to support a friend if they were competing. Every interaction from you felt like you were pushing me repeatedly, and I honestly had made up my mind that crash landing and matinee were, were not for me because of how crappy you made me feel. Flash forward to a year later. I had finally decided that I was going to do crash landing again. The prizes were worth it and I really needed something to help propel me forward in the scene. I had worked hard and nonstop all year to improve my drag and self-esteem and to gain a following doing other competitions in order to come back stronger and ready to compete. Winning was great because I finally would give myself a wider platform to showcase myself and yet I still don't feel like I won. Prior to my matinee booking, you kept emphasizing that I do something light, fun, and high energy, and I had to grapple with doing a number that wasn't true to me or doing something, or grapple with a number that wasn't true to me, doing something with the pop, top 40s pop music, which you were heavily implying. As a result, I ended up with two numbers that I wasn't happy with. Additionally, you kept emphasizing the amateur part when stating that I was the winner of an amateur competition and hyped me up much less on the mic. I continue to feel less hyped anytime you announce me on the stage and I honestly stopped coming up during crash landing when past winners had the opportunity to promote themselves because I always felt a strong and welcoming energy from you. Every conversation with you feels like you are looking for people to wow you and kiss your ass and I've never believed in doing that. As a result, I've always felt there was a certain opportunity that would never be granted to me. I'd given up hope performing at Roscoe's because you host most of the programming there. And after my initial matinee, it seemed like the only other time I'd get a paid matinee booking is if I won it again. There are certain performers that you select to favor and uplift in the city, regardless of where they are in their drag evolution. As a result, they have a chance to make more money in drag to fund a better appearance and gain a bigger following. And while your actions may not be overtly race, racially charged, it definitely speaks to your lack of understanding on how all these comp, com, components make it harder for rising performers, especially black performers to succeed. You have limited the amount of performers as a result of color you choose to favor and literally only one drag king that you have repeatedly booked. As a result, it is harder to fund outlets to, that improve one's drag. I'm very much a crafty king, but there are limits to my abilities and being able to afford better makeup, outfits, wigs, photoshops, and video content helps significantly. Most people are like me. Drag is not their full-time job and they aren't working some well-paying corporate job to fund their art. Having access to bookings with higher booking fees and larger audiences to tip help cover the cost of funding this art form, especially for performers of color as well as AFAB performers who tend to get tipped less anyway. I'm not asking for an apology because I don't want one from you. I don't think our personalities will ever click and I'm okay with you not favoring my drag because ultimately I perform because of what it means to me and it if you don't like it, that's your prerogative. But I wanna change for other up and coming performers, for the ones that are scared to compete because they know it's one of the few gateways to furthering your drag career and are fearful if they don't succeed, who don't want to feel like they have to kiss up to you in order to have you increase their chances of winning or getting booked. I ask that you hold yourself accountable and think about how you interact with people on a daily basis, as well as how you treat mobility in the drag scene. Audiences look to you as the host for an idea on how to react to each performer. So consider the discrepancies on how you hype people up and introduce crowds to diversity and performances in terms of race, gender performance and style of performing. You hold the power to introduce the audience to types of drags they haven't seen before. It is your job to set the tone without mocking or making light of what they're doing. People see who's on your posters as indications on who to book and follow that they can hold a heavy impact on one's career. I think the, job, the Chicago drag community is being very kind to you and asking that you only relinquish some power rather than stepping down from your shows entirely. I demand that, your show, uh, that you show your gratitude by enacting conscientious changes to make the scene you frequent and the shows you run more inclusive. Show an equal amount of support for the performers who, co who compete and are booked by both 
by you both on and off stage. Numerous people have poured their money, time, and talents into the stages you provide, and I challenge you to reciprocate those gifts. Utilize your platform to uplift more than just your select favorite performers. Mend how you respond to your situations and interact with people on a daily basis. Allow them to, the chance to respect you rather than fear you. Sincerely, Luca Me. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Tatiana, for being part of this and helping set so much of this up and for sharing uh, Luke's words this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Bye, Lucy. All right. So um, from here on out, we are reaching the end of this. And uh, at this point uh, in the conversation, I wanted to go back over the uh, list of demands. Uh, just to preface this, uh, this list of demands does start um, in this digital age and will continue on back into when we are in the bars. Um, if there's anything that needs to be clarified about how exactly that will go, we can go over that um, we, in, in detail. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with the different demands that we have here. Um, also, just to reiterate what uh, Zola was saying, too, before we get into this, um, Ben, I hope you know that this is really, really, really a huge deal that um, a lot of these people are not asking for re revenge in this instance and just asking for a little bit of restorative justice. Um, there's a lot of people involved in this conversation who thought that we should not ever hear from you again, that you should not be included in a conversation, that you should be completely defunded, have all of the shows that you have drop you and no one work with you from here on out. There's a list of people that have already signed that said they would not work with you if you didn't meet with these demands afterwards either. And one thing I'm still trying to struggle with is for myself, um, trying to find a reason why we should give you the second chance. So before I give you, before we go over these list of demands again, if you could give me a reason why you deserve the second chance when you have completely kept so many other people from having second chances and completely defunded entertainers and people of color for years from even having a chance, why do you deserve a second chance? Um. I, you know, we talk about going forward and I mean, all I can do is to step back. Um, yeah, I, I, I fully admit that I had too much power at, um, at matinee um and uh i've already i mean i've already told sean at roscoe's i do the um for xyz i do the booking there for um xyz or at least like liaison between them and i've said i'll happily give that up um you know i i to kind of borrow from what sean and brendan said from what brendan specifically said uh, I, I do want to help so much. And I think that there is a lot of individual conversations that need to be had. And, and also, uh, planning that needs to be done in going forward. Um, I don't need to be there for all of it, but I, uh, just logistically speaking, I, I don't, I would like to relinquish a, you know, a certain amount of power. Um, and I do yeah, think that's that definitely going to happen. My own stepping back is, uh, you know, I don't entirely know what to say. I, I just to be full face about it. I, I don't know what to say. And, and hearing people talk is, uh, you know, it's fucked up. So I, I'm definitely going into these conversations for people that are open to talking to me. Um, so I just have like to you. say, um, you said that it was fucked up and it is fucked up. It's, it's been, and it's been really fucked up for a long time. It's really fucked up. As you said that for so long, so many people felt they didn't even have a voice that they could have a conversation with you. It's fucked up that you're supposed to be one of the most influential people in the scene and you've created uh, this bubble where you're untouchable and you can't even have a conversation with yourself. It's uh, fucked up that you've been able to continue to perpetuate this like anti-racism and get away 
away with being so cruel to so many people for so long and that even people in positions of power have felt like they haven't been able to say anything to you. That's really fucked up. I agree. It's extremely fucked up. Even to myself, I had to have a fight with myself because I was like, how did me, someone who is so outspoken and tries to do so much for people, stand by idly for so long to be like punked into this situation where I wasn't even fully standing up to you as much as I should. The best way I could stand up to you, I felt like, was to pull myself out of situations with you, maybe throw back a retort, maybe be able to, you know, arm some other people with some knowledge, but I feel like I should have done more. So my promise now is to do even more in watching out for the youth and the people in this scene and making sure that they are being heard and that people are being held accountable for the shit that they are doing, because it's been fucked up for a long time. It really has been. So you know what, we're gonna go back into this. Uh... Actually, before, before we do, um, I, I know that it's, there's a lot being said right now, but what I am hearing and what I am seeing and also just pulling what I know I would want to hear, kind of putting myself in, in the situation is to hear you just say that you're sorry. And to oh. hear you say that you're sorry and you fucked up and you won't do it again. I mean, Yes, I, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to the entire community and I'm sorry to so many people that I'm going to have to have these specific conversations with. And one thing that I talked about in the, and one thing that Bambi touched on is that because there was a dynamic um, where, you know, people feel like they, they couldn't come to me and say things. And so I did get too comfortable because I thought that in, uh, you know, I thought more people liked me or, or were, you know, it was really just don't, don't step on our toes or you're not going to get something. And, and that has sunk in. Um, and and I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just like um, I also like wanted to like say with Kat about just kind of coming back to accountability is that I know that you are an intelligent person and I do know for a fact that you did know that you had this power and you did know sometimes that you were wielding it inappropriately and you did know that you were literally trying to get people canceled, defunded, not have a job. You did know. Um, and the fact we've had personal conversations where you say, yeah, you don't have that big of a circle circle or people around you. I feel like it's, you, you, you do know those things. You do know that, that people have a problem with you. And I feel like it's something that should have been addressed a long time ago. And you just thought that it never was going to be. That's fair. And so here we are. Yeah. And it, it, that's fair. So, um, Shimmy, uh, I would like to go over this list of demands. Okay. Um, I've already talked to Ben about these and they have agreed to them. I just wanted to expand to make sure not only Ben was clear, but that the uh, owners of the bar heard this and were clear on going forward. Like I said earlier, um, it took us a lot to get to this point to decide, you know, how we were going to grant you um, this second chance. Um, so I really hope you take all of these seriously. Um, so starting with the first one. We demand that Drag Matinee be hosted by a Black queen as a solo host for a bi-weekly trade-off, someone who cares and appreciates Black art beyond what tricks they can do. This person would not be picked by you. It would be picked by the Black Drag Council. And we are adding many people to that conversation to make sure it's fair and balanced. Um, we, of course, would touch in with you on these situations. Um, but other than that, uh, we just want to reiterate that this show would be done on our terms. Uh, the host will have the same control on that night as you would. So they will be taking care of the money. They will be paying performers and you will not be receiving any money on the nights that you do not work. Um, I mean, this is new. Um, well, I feel like when we had the phone conversation, you kind of alluded to the fact that you weren't really uh, here to really actually give up control. And as we've been talking about in this phone conversation, that's a big part of the problem with you is that you want to hold on to the control and the power in the scene. We feel that it is only possible to actually have people learn how to do this and be in control of it is if they're actually in control. So not under Tranica's umbrella, not under this, um, it would be their own entity. I, 
here's what I'll say on that is my relationship with Berlin. I, I, I there, there's definitely a, a conversation that. Well, I've already started talking to the conversation with Berlin. All I need to know is that you agree with this. Um, this would be that two Saturdays a month are out of my control. Yes, and that includes online and when we go back to the club. Um, so I let mean, me just remind you that if this is something that you cannot agree upon on these terms, that everyone who signed this letter will no longer be performing with you at any of the bars that you work at. Um, I mean, if that's what it takes, if that's what it takes. But also, are you actually online for this? Because saying is that's what it takes doesn't actually make me believe that well, you're, you're going to be a part of this. You know, I, I, I just feel like, because I'm hearing a lot of this for the first time, like I want to, from the back end, like I, I will relinquish that control, I will. But, you know, I just, it's all kind of, coming out quick and I'm but the thing uh, is we've had this conversation and this is a conversation that also could have been started a long time ago like I said earlier it could have but it, it you know it wasn't and I I uh I'm kind of answering off the cuff here so it well I don't think it's really too much off the cuff because we talked about all this earlier and you've had at least a week talk about something. completely giving up control of the shows we talked about the host and I this is exactly you. what we talked about on the phone, Tranica, which was kind of a problem of mine when having a phone conversation with you because I knew it might come up that you would say we didn't talk about this, but we talked about exactly this. And the reason I made this a, a part of this conversation was tonight is because how you acted on the phone when I brought it up. I said that I wanted to include... You said basically that you wanted people to work under the umbrella of T-Rex. And I'm saying that that is still you being in control and that that does not work for us. All right. So, so what I'm, what I'm hearing, I'm just going to step in real quick. So what I'm hearing um, is that there is not an agreement on the demand. And so if there is not an agreement on the demand, then the, the actions happen. And so the question now becomes, T-Rex, if you are not willing to make this agreement and, you know, as, as someone who has read the, the letter, um, it felt pretty clear. Um, but if, if you're not willing to make that agreement, then are you willing to then be someone who the community is not willing to work with? Because those seem like those are the two options right now. Just here's, here's what changed for me from my, this is, I just want to get this out real quick. Um, it was that there would be a host in my place and that I would still be behind the scenes doing the things that I do. Um, and uh, I said that we did not agree to that, that those were not the terms. That's exactly what we talked about on the phone. And, and, just, and just, to, just to be clear, you know, if, if the statement that you were making previously is that you are willing to give up some power and control, this is an effort and this is a concrete way of you doing that. And so, so the question then becomes, are you actually making that statement or are you not making that statement? And again, we are not trying to we're not trying to put you on the spot right here, right now, because the letter has been out for a minute. But we do, we, but we do want to make sure that if what you were saying previously, that you are willing to give up control and power and, and the way that you are perceived and run shows in Boys Town, and we are giving you an avenue to do that, then either statement A or statement B is true. It's just that the original letter said hosting and not behind the scenes stuff it said hosting and that is the thing this is the original letter we have that i read to you but okay so i host but i also set up the budget and cast the show and when we talked i said i said you want to you want to have someone replace me as host and i said but what about we had a show that was once a week or that was once a month, I'm sorry, that would not just do that, that would 
give up that control completely. You didn't say that. You That's said what I, you're, you're, you're repeating what I just said, that to give up the control completely. When you said on the phone That wasn't part of the original demand. That was what I came back with. And you I said, said it once to me. You're bringing you said, back the demand. You said stuff would still be under the Tranica umbrella, which means I would hold the purse strings, your words verbatim, I would pay the performers and everything else. And I said, no, a part of those terms includes what I just read to you. Um, I, uh, if I'm giving up, um, yeah, I'll give up two Saturdays a month. Um, and obviously this is going to have to go into further debate with Berlin and not me because I, well, absolutely. And that's why we have Taylor here and I've already started the conversation. We just need to make sure you were on board for it. Then I guess there we are. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess there we are. Can we get an actual okay. yes? Yes. Okay. The next on the list of demands. We want the dictatorship over number selection to stop immediately. Many people already went over this, um, and I'm sure you already know what this means. I've been a part of this too since the very beginning. Um, what it specifically entails though, and that I think may kind of get left out of the conversation is um, the fact that there were different standards for different people, uh, a lot of people felt like. So somebody else may be able to come and turn a silly ballad or do whatever, but if there is a person of color or a black person who tries to do the same thing, they would get berated, talked down to, seem less than, even though their performance, their work is as equal to, if not better than that. So could you agree with that? We want the dictatorship over number selection to stop immediately. Uh, yes. Okay, the uh, next on the list of demands, we want to hold you and yourself to the same standard as you do all the other queens, which means new outfits, new hair, and new makeup every show. Is this something that you think you can do realistically? Um, no. Okay, what's the problem with that? Uh, I mean, I would just say remove the idea that there needs to be a new thing every show. Um, can I ask why you would then hold everyone else to that same standard? Um, because I work every week, uh, and and you know, if I'm saying the so my, you work once a week, which means that it would probably be a lot easier for you to get one outfit. Or but I said, I was I was speaking about matinee specifically. So I said, if you come back to matinee, uh, you know, bring me something different than you brought last week. That's the way that or last month. That's the way that conversation would happen, and people would work the show once every six weeks so or four 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 to six weeks sometimes uh if they're more regular and so uh you know when we were getting repeat stuff and there was six weeks in between that was really the conversation so uh as far as th that'll that'll be removed then that'll be removed uh you're allowed to wear whatever you want whenever you want also will you be uh Will you be agreeing to this and also be stepping up your looks for each drag matinee after this? Um, I mean, I don't know how to quantifiably say, will I be stepping it up? But I c consistently get new hair every few months and, and stone new things. So I, I will continue to do that. Uh, so so T-Rex, one, one way that you can objectively step it up is to, again, hold yourself to the exact same standards that you would hold another queen to. And, and you, you can present it just as you would any other queen. Yeah, um, so if that means, you know, uh, no same outfits for the six weeks, uh, same, no same hair for the six weeks, whatever, whatever that standard was. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just saying, can we just remove it? <laughs> I mean, I'm just, and just say, wear whatever you want and there's no, requirements i mean well some some of uh, going back to what going back to what people have mentioned as as complaints is the fact that they are they're considering that there are two different standards and that that is the problem there are two different standards so what we are asking for is that there is the same standard and so by removing it you don't actually make it equal what you do is by removing it there is still the assumption and there is still the undercurrent of there still being two different standards. So what we are asking for and what is in the request is that there is the same standard. That's, yes. Okay. The same. 
Great, thank you so much for that, Shimmy. Um, next on the list, we demand that you book more Black local talent past tokenism in all shows that you host. That includes XYZ, plot twists, et cetera. Um, just in case you need to know the definition of tokenism, it's the practice of making only a symbolic effort to do a particular thing, especially by recruiting a small number of people from under underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of sexual or racial equality within a workforce. Is that something that you can commit yourself to from here on out? Yes. Okay, that is great to hear. Um, let's see. The next one, we demand that the microaggressions in and offline, private and public come to a halt immediately, including but not limited to, I hold the mic, you're wearing that again, do something funny, only do high energy numbers. Is that something you can agree to? Yes. Um, speaking specific, uh, specifically to Roscoe's in this situation, um, uh, we've already touched on this, but like I said, uh, the Black Drag Council would like to see more Black representation in shows like XYZ. Um, we would also like to know if it's possible to bring on a maybe rotating different uh, Black co-host for the RuPaul's Drag Race viewing parties that you host. That is certainly an option that can be considered in the future once we get back to hosting parties, but yes, who knows what our okay. future holds with that. Okay, good to know. All right. And do, 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 do. that actually looks like that is the complete list of uh, demands in that situation. We have also went over um, all the speakers here. Um, I feel like I've covered the basis. Shimmy, is there something you want to add in before I do closing remarks? Um, I just want to say again that this has been this has been a very heavy conversation. This has been a very heavy conversation for everyone. Um, I have been kind of keeping an eye on the chat and there's been a lot in the chat. Um, but I do want to thank everyone for being willing to come to the table. Um, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. I would very strongly recommend that conversations continue with the Black Drag Council and that everyone is continuing to be open and, and realize that part of restorative justice means that you will have to give things up to restore people to wholeness. Um, again, just want to thank everyone uh, this has been a tough conversation and I just wanna thank everyone for being willing to participate. Thank you so much, Shimmy. Thank you for uh, being here, the mediator. Um, thank you to everyone who showed up as the representatives today. Um, thank you to Taylor. Thank you to Brendan. Uh, thank you to Sean for being here for this conversation. Um, like I said, we're going to have uh, another roundtable discussion um, on Tuesday of next week where we'll be talking specifically to the bars about these situations. Um, I just uh, would like to reiterate again, uh, thank you everyone who was here to watch this and to support um, this town hall. Like we said in the letter and we said before, this is not a wish hunt. We're not coming here to we're just coming here to uh, get some much needed justice that is deserved to people, Black people in this community. Um, so thank you all for being here and being a part of this and be willing to uh, help actually make this movement uh, go forward. Uh, I will be checking in with our scribe and our secretary um, just uh, to make sure that everyone is working on this stuff and that it's in motion. Uh, and from here on out, I mean, honestly, everyone just take care of themselves and make sure you're supporting uh, Black people, amplifying Black voices and doing the work every day to be anti-racist, not just racist, anti-racist. Uh, thank you all again for this conversation. I appreciate it. Um, and everyone have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Shimmy. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. Well, that is it, y'all. That is absolutely it. We are done up in here, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this. I am hoping that this is something that continues on from here. I'm hoping that people were able to take this and uh, would be able to use it in their own lives and their own platforms and their own community um, because we need to make changes and we need to see people making real fucking changes because like so many people said before, we don't have to be doing this shit. We can be absolutely done with you in this situation, but here we are giving you this chance. So you better take it and you better take it damn well. So uh, thank you so much, everybody. Have a, a great evening and I'll be seeing you all soon. Thank you.